Can I welcome everyone to the 14th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? Can I ask those naughty boys over there to behave themselves? Thank you very much. And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is a decision on whether to take a number of items of business in private. Firstly, is everyone content that items three and four of this meeting is in private? Thank you. Secondly, do members agree to review evidence on workforce planning in private at future meetings? Once again, thank you. Right. The second item of business is our first evidence session as part of the committee's inquiry into workforce planning in Scotland schools. The committee is starting with a session with trainee teachers, followed by qualified teachers to provide contacts for its inquiry. Can I welcome the first panel, which is trainee teachers and one previous trainee teacher. Before we begin, can I thank you for taking the time to respond to the committee's request for views through its questionnaire and for agreeing to give evidence. This is very much an information gathering session to inform the committee's scrutiny and we appreciate your sharing personal experience, so please only ask the questions you are comfortable responding to. Don't feel that you have to answer anything that you, you don't want to. In addition, given the number of people we are hearing from today and the size of this committee, members will try to ask questions of specific attendees where possible. So you don't have to answer every question, especially if someone else covers your point. You also have the option of sending written comments after your session if there is anything that you do not get a chance to convey today. That said, can I now welcome Halla Price, trainee teacher, Kimberly Miller Drummond, previous trainee teacher, Mark Melrose, trainee teacher, Willie McLeod, trainee teacher, and Karis Boyle, trainee teacher. As a standard, I'll kick off with the first question, which is a quite simple question, which is, asking about your motivations for becoming a teacher in the first place. Can I ask who would like to start? Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, my motivations for becoming a teacher have been mainly the fact that through teaching you have this amazing opportunity to be a positive influence in children's lives. And I worked with children all the way through my own education, the younger years in primary school, helping out with various clubs and in the younger classes. And I just loved it, and that filled me with this passion that you can make a difference and you can be this positive influence in so many people's lives. Thank you. Kimberly, you, well, I'll come back to you, Kimberly, later Very on. Very similar right, reasons, okay. to be fair. Um, probably the key motivation for me was being able to impact children. In, I, I first trained in Stirling, I should be clear about that, and then I went to Strathclyde. I went to Stirling in 2001, and um, I, I don't know if you still call it an area of deprivation, but at the time that's what it was, and um, I just felt that the impact that I could have on some of the children there would sort of influence them to, to get themselves out of that pattern of unemployment, um, leaving school and not doing anything things like that. So that was kind of the main motivation to kind of show them that you can change things. I myself came from a, a background similar to that. That's great. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, along similar lines, uh, but coming from an industrial background myself, nine years as an engineer for a defence company, I found that job stability was another key factor for me to consider. William. Yeah, I would uh, agree. Job stability was a huge way up there. I'd already worked in a school for a number of years as a, as a technician, and I was assisting pupils in various ways in that. And I felt I could do more. I already had a degree, uh, so uh, becoming a teacher is a natural kind of career progression for myself as well. Thank you very much. And finally, Cara? Um It might sound kind of cliche, but um, I really wanted to be there for the light bulb moment. So, like, when a child has been struggling and it's just like they get it. Because I remember I was that child sometimes in primary school, especially when it came to things like maths and, you know, things like that. So I wanted to be there to be the, for the light bulb moment and for the child to remember, oh, it was Miss Boyle that taught me that, you know, so. Oh, so really, it's all about getting your name in lights. So. <laughs> be remembered. <laughs> that, that, that's great. I mean, you they, they all seem to have sort of similar motivations for doing it, but you're all coming from different places, really, so that's really interesting. OK, we are going to start with some questions with Ruth. Um, convener, before I ask my question, I need to declare an interest in that my child's school is represented in the second panel, so I will be 
remaining quiet for the second panel. Um, but good morning um, to all of you. Um, thinking about um, your motivation to become teachers, um, some of the evidence that we've received um, reveals that there's a, a, a sort of a bit of discomfort around how teachers are thought of. And I'd be interested to hear your reflections on how we as politicians contribute to that, how the the um, debates and conversations we have about education and how education is in Scotland influence that and influence how you feel about teaching as a profession. Thank you. Does anybody wish to lead off on this one? Mark? So one part that I'd say generally teachers are seen as being quite moany. My wife, myself, <laughs> says about you only ever hear about teachers complaining. Having gone into teaching, um, I have seen that myself as well, and I can't say that I well, but I can't say I disagree. And the reason is, it's just constant changes these days, um, and that's obviously coming from the government coming down from about. We've changed to the CFE, we've changed to national qualifications, which the feeling on the ground was that standard grades weren't broken. Why were they changed? This merely needed updated. Um, so for me, I think it's this attitude that people have towards teachers is stemming from the constant changes that are coming from Parliament. Does anybody else have a comment to make on that? Um, I found that there's been quite a lot of stigma about the perceived intelligence of teachers. So teaching is not, like, in my experience, teaching is not held as a profession where you're considered to be of, if, if you're a teacher, you're not, you're not held off in school as someone who's going to get the best grades. I personally was discouraged in school by my own teachers from applying to be a primary school teacher. They suggested that I would do um, a degree first followed by the um, one-year conversion. So there, there is definitely the stigma that teachers are not as intelligent as, I don't know, other members of society, which to me felt like a real sort of barrier to going into it if, if I wasn't going to be given as much respect as other professionals might be. I suppose the, the, the question back to Mark is, do you feel that what we need is a, is a period of stability now to let yes. teachers get on with teaching? Yes. Yeah. As, a, and as a technology teacher as well, we've recently just been um, handed updated benchmarks as opposed to the significant aspects of learning, um, which, again, just as the SQA are changing national courses and the assignments, technology teachers are finding ourselves having to deal with these new benchmarks for the broad general education as well. And I definitely think that that's the feeling from the schools I'm getting as well, is that a, a period of stability would be really welcome. Okay. I, I, I understand exactly where Mark's coming from, and I agree with him about a period of stability being uh, necessary. With regards to the kind of professionalism aspect, I, I wouldn't like to be too negative. I do believe that teachers are viewed as professionals, I know there are, there are issues with the SQA and Education Scotland who may not be treating them as professionals. Uh, but uh, on the whole, the public perspect uh, perspective uh, is very much, I think, that teachers are professionals. So can I, I, can, like I, can I just come in on that point there? You say that you don't think SQA and Education Scotland are treating them as professionals. Yeah. Would you like to expand on that? In, in regards to the fact that the, the, the kind of... Uh, the, 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 Documents that are produced, perhaps, uh, are not uh, professionals. Uh, documents that you would send fellow professionals. Uh, I, I, th I think this is a okay. quite a common theme. In the placement schools I've been in, the documents I've seen from these would not reflect professional communications between equal partners. Right. Okay, that's very interesting. Thanks very much. Uh, okay. The, we'll move on to the teacher training. We've got quite a number of people who would like to ask questions on teacher training. Uh, Liz, would you like to start us? Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, if I just go back to my own teacher training many, many years ago, um, I felt very strongly that uh, the, uh, the actual theoretical aspect was actually not particularly helpful. Whereas, as you're all nodding to that, but the actual classroom uh, placements were extremely helpful and you found out whether you could cope as being a teacher and what you could do well and what you could perhaps not do so well. Do you, can I just ask you about these two aspects of teacher training? Do you feel that the placements in schools are working and that those people who are looking after you in schools particularly, A, have sufficient time to look after you properly and B, are giving you all the right advice? And 
on the other side, do you feel that what's happening on the sort of theoretical aspect is good enough or you would like to see some changes in that? It's refreshing to hear that your experience is match, match my own perfectly uh, with regards to the placements being the, the real benefit of the teacher training year. They are by far the highlight. Uh, I have only been in two separate schools. Uh, one is a large school, one was a, lar a small school. The smaller school, uh, naturally, uh, there was uh, enough staff in there that my mentor could spend a, a significant amount of time with me. I benefited hugely from that. The larger school, I would say, can only say positive things about them, but the one negative thing would be uh, my mentor was very, very busy, head of department. He could not spend the time with me. Uh, the, the, the smaller schools could, even though I, I'm not saying anything negative at all about him. He tried his best. Uh, with regards to the university side of things, very little of what we actually work on in, within the university seems to have any relevance to what happens in the classroom. For example, next to nothing on classroom behaviour management would be looked at in university. <coughs> Could you just expand on some of the other aspects of the uh, university and or college training? Uh, I think, personally, I think you're quite right to flag up this issue uh, about classroom management. There isn't, within this evidence, quite a few people who are um, making the point that they're not very sure about additional support training. Um, they feel that the amount of time that's spent, spent on learning how to teach literacy is not sufficient. Do, do you have any other comments on things that we could do better within the actual theoretical aspects of the teacher training? I think the, the problem that we, we have and with the university that uh, I am currently attending, the likes of uh, literacy, there would be a single week where we focus on literacy. That would be it. One week. One week. That would be the focus for that week. Okay. With the likes of the additional support needs, I believe that uh, within my university, again, that was covered very well. That was a full week's focus again, uh, and we had a, a very good lecture deliver, de deliver that. Uh, I think it helped that uh, that lecture was in the same physical room as, uh, as, as ourselves, which is not always the case. Clear. Yes, at this stage, because I know Ross has got a number of questions round about that he would like to ask. Uh, sorry for interrupting, uh, William, but... No, that's fine if anyone yeah. else wants to take the floor. OK. Uh, Karis? Um, I've only had one school-based placement, um, and I was actually really lucky with mine, because um, my classroom teacher, she gave me so much help. Um, and then the deputy head teacher as well, she was really involved in my placement, which I thought was a really nice thing, that the school was so inclusive. Um, and then with regards to university, our workshops in like second semester were really practical and they gave us lesson ideas, which I thought was also really helpful. Um, but again, like things like behaviour management and classroom management, we weren't taught it that much. Um, and it, but I guess it's a thing you can't really learn it until you see it as well. Um, I was really lucky with my class too, like behaviour management really wasn't an issue. There was like a couple of kids, but not many. Um, and additional support needs. I know we said we'd talk about it later, but again, not really taught that much at university. Could I just clarify one thing just to finish on? Um, William, you mentioned uh, that there was just one week where you were asked to look at the literacy issue. Do you mean just one week in the whole training aspect? Uh, yes, so far. So the, the way the university runs it is each week there is a focus on a given, uh, a given area. Uh, so... Yes. To the best of my recollection, it was a single week for, for literacy. And did you feel that was sufficient? I, th I think literacy, perhaps, I would have less of an issue with because literacy has been worked on throughout when we're doing essays, etc. I would probably have more issues with numeracy because there is less, uh, less chance for uh, the university lecturers to to see that we're numerate throughout. You can, t you can very quickly tell if somebody's literate when, when you've read a couple of essays of theirs. But numeracy is a, is a different thing. And I would, I would maybe focus more on the, for, for my own subject on the numeracy side of things. But I, I, I think going back to the basics in these would be, would be helpful. Thank you very much. Kimberly, you wanted to come in? Yeah. Um, 
To break it down, a uni course is generally 18 weeks theory-based and 18 weeks in placement. <clears throat> Out of those 18 weeks, there are some holidays, so you're not sort of there all the time. One week is quite a lot of time um, from the point of view of the whole week being focused on one issue. Um, you don't just have one class or one lecture on it. You have various different classes. Um, at the uni I was at, it was split into uh, policies and perspectives was one, um, and principles and practice was the other. You also had your subject-based classes, and every single one of those lectures and seminars focused on that particular week's issue. Um, so it actually is quite a lot of time um, if it's a full week that's that's given to the issue. Okay, Hala, you wanted to come in here? Um, the structure of the BEAD, which I understand is no longer being run, but with the fourth year, my final year, there were options courses which were invaluable. They were they were they were fantastic and you had you got to choose two. So there were things additional support needs, outdoor learning, modern languages, which we had received no provision on during the first three years, which meant that I had a fantastic experience of cognitive and social emotional development education and also modern languages, but that there are aspects of teaching such as outdoor learning, additional support needs, which because I didn't select those as my first options, I have had no experience in. And these courses, which are hugely valuable, the majority of the people on the BEAD course are coming out having not experienced. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, you wanted to come in. Yeah, some of the things I was wanting to talk about have been touched on, Liz, but actually, before I say anything, let me just do the, 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 the slightly glib politicians thing. I, mean, I think, uh, could I just say that I think, regardless of what debates happen in this place, um, I think everyone in the teaching profession should be under no illusions about how important uh, we all view uh, your profession and just how fundamental it is to not just education but the whole of the country. So, um, but my question is this, um, I'd just really be interested to know how, um, especially in the, we've talked a bit about secondary education, but in, the, in primary education, those literacy and numeracy, I mean, do you th how well covered do you think those aspects are um, for primary teacher training? I guess that would be Hallow would be best place. <laughs> I think that literacy, what we got taught in first year, sort of the fundamentals of reading and writing and how important they are, was very valuable. What we were taught then was just then reiterated. So I was taught for the first few years that reading is very good for children, it makes them creative, which was very useful in first year, but for that to then be reinforced for another two years was unnecessary. And having experience of the schemes such as Read, Write, Inc. and um, the big writing ventures, having some sort of input into how these schemes work and how they're beneficial would have been more valuable. In terms of numeracy, we spent a lot of time going over ideas of activities we could do. However, there wasn't enough focus on the teachers themselves having the skills to teach numeracy other than a maths audit, which we completed ourselves in second year, which did, it did very little, in all honesty, to improve our own mathematical um, knowledge and understanding. I do, I do not believe that everyone graduating from Murray House this year has a sufficient skills in numeracy to be able to teach it to 11-year-olds at a reasonable standard. So just to sort of paraphrase, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of focus on the importance of these things, yes. but not necessarily about kind of the practical techniques about how to deliver. I mean, would that be right? Yeah, that would be right. I mean, is that something other members of the panel would reflect and agree with? Yeah. C can I just pick up on some comments that, 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 that Mark made? Um, you, you touched on kind of the national uh, qualifications and also BGE. Now, one of the things that got raised in an informal session that we had is that there's some challenges both with composite classes, uh, teaching national four or five together, indeed sometimes higher as well, and also sometimes issues with uh, S3, just because uh, in terms of you know, uh, filling up the, the space. Is that, are those the sorts of issues that you have found? Are there other issues that you're referring to when you were highlighting BGE and national qualifications? I think purely, <coughs> sorry, on a BGE level, um, the changes that we've had to face to the benchmarks recently, but Within technology, certainly, speaking from a technology point of view, 
We have six separate subjects that we have to cover. Broad general education does not work for technologies. We cannot cover sufficient course knowledge to then move kids on to a national level. So that's why some schools you see will start covering their nationals in third year. Some of them will try and stick to the system, if you will, and do it in fourth year. These kids that are just doing it over one year are getting they're disadvantaged. They are not getting the same education, specific education to their course as anyone else is. And in terms of now having composite classes, with the removal of the units from National 5 and units, units, it's going to become very difficult. Speaking purely at the school that I'm at placement just now, they're finding it hard and they feel like they're letting kids down because you're having to make a call very early on whether or not a child will be National 4, in which case you have to cover the added value unit as well as the other units or National 5. What do you do if a kid's doing fine at National 5, gets to the end and then fails it? With the old system, you had the fallback of National 5s, and within standard grades, you had the fallback of Credit General, General Foundation. It's going to end up failing pupils, this system, now, for me. I'm just wondering, final question, just if any other sort of subject areas would reflect that, that those sorts of uh, insights from any of the other panel members? Technical as well. Uh, so I can, I can agree fully with what Mark is saying, uh, but I can't add anything to to what he's already said. Little squeeze. Yeah. yeah. It's very helpful. Thank you. Julian, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to come back to what how I was saying about, about the numeracy. Um, just just for more information, the qualifications for entry into the course, what, what, in terms of, of, of what you have to have in terms of, of proving that you are numerate, what, what, what are, what's expected of you? Higher maths of standard? No. Um, I needed to have a two at... Um, standard grade maths or you could have I think it was intermediate two but an, an A intermediate two but intermediate two can be carried out over the course of what, four years if needs be mm -hmm. um, it can be a very long process which if it takes four years to get your intermediate two maths are you in the best position to be able to teach children do you have the requisite understanding to be able to convey focus on um getting more STEM subjects into primary and having and teachers having the confidence to be teaching like science, whatever. What in terms of qualifications is expected of you there um, before you, you get entry into, into Nothing. your course? I didn't have any they were the only requirements you need were a C at higher English and a two at credit maths. And so when you're actually undertaking your, your, your course, um, is there any provision for you to be picking up those so science subjects as, as you go along? No. OK. OK, thank you very much. Tavish? One of my class, one specific and one general question. The first, the first, the general question is, uh, following on from Liz Smith's line of questioning, do you think the balance of what you are learning as teachers in our teaching colleges is right between practice and theory and where would you change it maybe the other way of asking that question is where would you change it where would you offer us some advice about how you might change that uh, I would uh, increase the actual placement time in schools uh, I would increase it significantly and in addition I would uh, add variety uh, I have only yeah. add, add a variety a to variety. the placement skills okay. I have only been in two placement schools yeah uh, one of which I've worked in for years so effectively I have only experienced one other school. And how would you tackle that point you made earlier on, Mr. McLeod, about the fact that you're the, the what did you say the principal teacher you were who was mentoring you in that big school just simply didn't have the time to give to, I, give to you? I, I would uh, I, I would uh, see if there was some way that that could be formalised uh -huh. that his timetable would be amended and uh, somehow to give space time for would be, it would be fine. Yeah. Uh, I think think there is a potential a potential issue there, and that in some previous years, uh, some Gaelic funding was found to pay for teacher time to assist mentoring students. Uh, so I think it could be done that way. Can you give me some sense of the balance at the moment between placements in schools and uh, the theory of of the courses? I mean, is it uh, how many weeks per year do you spend in schools as opposed to in the classroom? So my current split's 50-50, so right. it's a 30 week, yeah, 36 week course, as Kimball was saying, um, we're 18 weeks in, within the schools and 18 weeks within university. Um, for me, 
as Willie said, it's you do most of your learning on the job as a teacher. It's all fine getting this theory poured into you, sure. but it's that is not getting me prepared to go into a classroom to teach for well technology it's 20 pupils yeah we need more time spent subject specific as opposed to general teaching theories okay i would say that the makeup of every course is very different so perhaps more consistency is needed for example with the four-year course i know i've had a five-week placement in first and second year followed by a 10-week placement in third year and 12 weeks this year Whereas there are other students I know who did not experience any time in school on different courses at different universities um, until their third year when they took a whole year within a school. Which, from having spoken to class teachers, I don't know this is replicated across the whole of Scotland, but the people I've spoken to, the class teachers, said that having a pupil who had, a student who had never experienced being a placement in school to be there for a whole year was quite difficult to fit them in. Colleagues, it varies university to university? Uh, yes, it varies university to okay. university. And my experience, the balance was really good to have that build up yeah. of a smaller placement sure. followed. But if you're only doing it in a year, it's obviously impossible to have that build mm. up. Mm. But you wanted to come in? I did, yeah. Um, in terms of theory, you start off university with a theory block. And a lot of people on my course in particular were saying that they couldn't relate the theory um, at all until they actually went on placement. So it may be that a week or two introduction session in uni, then maybe a three week placement where you're just sort of observing, getting to know things, and you can actually see some of that theory in practice before going in and getting to the bones of the theory might work better. So is it just now you're likely to have a, a sizable block of theory before you have a yeah. placement? Yeah. And you're suggesting that you break that up somewhat? Yeah, right. I think okay. an earlier placement yeah. would be a benefit to understanding some of the theory. Okay, Carissa. Um, I agree with Kimberly, um, an earlier placement. In first year, we had a six week placement, um, but it was in second semester. And I know from speaking to like people on my course that first semester it was more we did psychology sociology and philosophy of education and it almost put some people off because we weren't like in the classroom and it's not necessarily things you can apply like especially the philosophy like I see I can't even remember it's things like Plato's cave is that what it is see <laughs> it is important to know but it's not something that I taught in the classroom and it's not something that I really applied in the classroom when I got to my placement um, and it did almost discourage people to leave um, so um, Upset, by the way. <laughs> no, no, no. Can I ask one other specific question, if I may? Um, a lot of focus at the moment about online security for children at schools, young people at schools, and and some concerns, obviously, about how much. Uh, I mean, my kids are absolutely standard on this; use their mobile phones all the time. Again, have in your training any focus or options or, or particular courses about both online security or just the use of, of digital medium now in a way which is completely different, I suspect, from, from earlier in life, shall we say, when I went to school, which is obviously a long, a long time, time ago. Yeah. Time. We didn't even have computers then. <laughs> um, something that we were taught really early on was about professionalism online. Um, and I guess that is really important. Um, when I went on to my placement, I actually did a lesson on internet safety. And one of the pupils had said to me, oh, you should never add a teacher on Facebook. And I was like, well, of course you shouldn't. Like, we have lives outside of school. And uh, I went home that day to have a friend request from her. Um, <laughs> so it was a bit ironic. Um, but it was, my Facebook was really private because I knew it had to be, which was fine. But I think a lot of teachers do need to keep in mind that you have to be professional in your normal life as well, like life outside of school. I mean, I, I take the, very much the point about you as a teacher, but what about the, the, the children you will teach? Uh, have you been, have you had discussions or gone, there's been nothing about... Not really at university, no. no. Okay. no. Um, I decided to do my internet safety lesson because I heard the kids in my class talking about things like Snapchat. Yes. Um, but none of them are old enough for Snapchat. Yeah, exactly. So. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add to that, that in four years I've now completed my training and I've had a few talks about professionalism, about my own professionalism online, and I have had no provision for any form of ICT, which is alarming. Okay. As well, there's been no 
no, no specific training delivered through the PGDE on internet safety lessons. So we expect those teachers and to go into classroom and teach kids, all of whom are sitting with their smartphones, yeah, without having had any discussion? That, yeah. yeah, OK. Yeah. Right. Okay, Daniel, you much. wanted to come Sorry, Harry, can I just clarify what you said there about no provision for ICT? Are you saying just within the context of teaching children about it, or no provision whatsoever? All right, OK, thank you. Ross? Thanks, Mayor. As has been mentioned previously, I'd like to talk a little bit about additional support needs and just start off with a, a general question about it. Um, do you feel that the courses that you're on either uh, have already or will equip you to support young people with additional support needs, bearing in mind that we've got one in four children in schools in Scotland with identified additional support needs, but also the challenge for teachers who have a role in flagging up where a support need might be there and need identified? Do you feel equipped and, and supported to do that? I already covered that personally, so I, I personally feel that that aspect was delivered well through my university. I'd say that not at all at um, Murray House for myself. Um, I went to my first school and was given a class with a young boy with autism, quite severe autism, and I was not prepared in the slightest for how to deal with it. and. I suggest that a lack of support within the schools as well means that many teachers also that are out there teaching just now do not feel prepared to deal with the more severe cases of ASN. Kimberly? Um, from a work perspective, yes, I'm quite well equipped to deal with ASN, but on a university course level, no. Um, we did a couple of weeks on inclusion we were taught the medical model and the social model of disability. Um, we had all these wonderful theorists sort of thrown at us, but no contextualisation and no specific training in autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, we, we were sort of told, yes, you'll probably come across two, three children in your class at any given time that have got maybe an additional support need, but they, they just don't give you, unless you elect to study as a professional specialisation, either autism, ASN, dyslexia, something like that, then no, it's not included in the course. You have to choose to do it. Yes, but can I ask why is there the disparity between those responses? William seems to think that it's, it's good. And, you know, both Mark and Kimberley are saying it's not. We are studying at different universities. So it's just, that, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. yeah that, okay. And I think as well as that, both Mark and I are studying PGDE. And is it both? Yeah, is it, are you doing PGDE? Oh, okay. 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 Sorry, Halla, you wanted to come on. I think that... The university has given me a really good course on social inclusion and on barriers to learning. However, there are so many specific additional support needs and each child is completely different and needs their own. They, you can't learn how to support everyone with the same additional support need because each child is different. So I believe that whilst the university has done a good job on um, promoting inclusion and how to have a general understanding of the additional support needs, the support needs to come within school and actually be child specific. Interesting about it being uh, an optional course in your fourth year you chose two optional courses does that mean that most people then going through your course will simply not have had that level of opportunity specifically for ASN because it simply wasn't something they chose in their final year yeah that's correct however the people that did the course again they've got slightly more of an understanding of it and slightly more understanding of how to support the ch child but again you go into school each child's completely different each child has completely different needs and you need support within the school as opposed to fixing it in university because it can't be it can't be taught generally and is there an expectation that you will have cpd opportunities on this once you're in full-time teaching if for those of you who believe that it's not been adequate in your initial education are you do you expect that there will be that opportunity I've already experienced that at my first placement. We had an in-service day and we had training on autism. So I do believe that it will be covered more within once we actually become qualified teachers. 
Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Is that you, Ross? Uh, Daniel, you seem to want to come in very briefly. Just given the prevalence of, of especially sort of dyslexia, uh, do you not? I mean, do you not think? Do you think, can you conceive of ever a teaching class where you don't have at least one child that has dyslexia? And, and do you think no? Just, that, that, that might be sensible just to have as an absolute bare minimum on ASN. Yeah. And the schools will um, come with a, um, a file, a pupil support file that says um, difficulties of a dyslexic nature, but they don't have an official diagnosis of dyslexia. And that's very, very common now in schools that maybe five or six children in one class will have difficulties of that nature without a diagnosis. Yeah, for that. Claire, uh, we're moving on to a different subject now. Thank you, thank you convener. And can I just say, um, as, as, as a start off, uh, thank you very much for the information that you've provided us this morning. It's been really interesting. Um, and I've, I'm sure I'm speaking for, for the rest of the committee here, that we really do value you, your input uh, into this inquiry. I just want to look at, at, at um, as, I guess, a step further from some of the information that you've given us. Um, are there any opportunities for you to feed into the university about your experience of the course, about what you feel hasn't been covered, um, and, and what you feel should be uh, added into your experience as a teacher or a trainee teacher, both at the, the one-year course or, or a, a four-year course level? Oh. Um, we have had, there's a very good focus within Edinburgh University about class representatives going forward to um, committees and meetings with the course organisers. However, as I've been studying on the last year of the B.Ed, there's no more B.Ed, so our feedback has been essentially, it, it's, been, it's been for the sake of it. We've seen no changes made. I've been a class rep in every single year, and every single year there has been no changes and no difference made based on our feedback. Or at least no visible changes. That one then. But I mean, you make the feedback. Do you get any feedback on the feedback that you've given? Do you do you find out if anything that you've said has been listened to in any way? No. No, it's just that you'll make comment and. We'll go to a meeting and we'll be it will be received and we'll be listened to and they'll go, oh yes, that's that's very interesting. That's a good point. But nothing follows yeah, from that. that yeah, there's, times, there's yeah. no follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Going to meetings, is that the only way that you are encouraged to provide feedback to the university? There are, there are other options. And if, if you have a specific problem, there are various routes you can go down to contact. But the general feedback for each class, for every single class, in every single course, I think, across the university has a class rep, and everyone from that class is invited to give feedback and comments to the class rep, and about twice a semester, you will get an opportunity to meet with the course organisers and share that feedback. Okay. Is that other people's experience too? Dundee, and I would say it's completely different. Um, at the end of every semester, we do an evaluation. Um, and I've got a friend who's in the year above me. And uh, if he, his year, have said something specific that wants changed, we always see the change. Um, so for example, we had a, an assignment last semester and it was on maths and science. And the year before, it was really kind of vague. It, didn't, it wasn't an easy assignment for them to do, which they all commented on, said it was quite difficult. And when we got it, it was really specific. Like, they told us like, exactly what we could write in our essay. Um, and then with regards to placement as well, um, the third years this year believed that the placement wasn't great timing due to assignments. So it means that our placement's going to be at a different time. So other people's negative experiences in the years before benefits the year before, uh, the year after. Okay. I, w I would like to just uh, I agree with that. I'm at a different university, but uh, we've uh, last week we were sent an uh, online feedback form. Uh, it can be anonymous uh, to feedback our experiences on the uh, our university experience. And before I started this last placement had a, a, quite a long uh, question and answer session regarding feedback with uh, one of the course leaders, which was very helpful. She had already fed back her proposed changes uh, and every one of them we, we agreed with would be a sensible change and we made extra suggestions. So the university has been open and ready to receive feedback. Um, Coming from Edinburgh University, I said again, we've got student reps in our class and 
the feedback they were once given coming back from a meeting with the sort of lead tutor was um, a dismissive, Ugh, students always ask for that same sort of idea and they find that they were getting that quite a lot. Um, one of the other interesting changes that has been talked about in Money House is changing the postgraduate course to a two year course. So rather than a one year postgraduate course, it would be two years with no additional time within the school. So it would all be university based. And just having taken a quick poll from um, my sort of cohort, the agreement was that not a single person would apply to that course because who can afford two years without a wage or without any sort of repayment at all. So that for me would be a big concern for like looking at the future of Murray House. Thank you for that. Could I, could I just ask then, it's, and it's really valuable to hear what, what your different experiences have been feeding back into the universities. What has your experience been when you've been at schools? Um, has there been an opportunity for you there to feed back on the placement, the quality of the placement, how useful it was, whether you felt supported? We've heard a little bit of some of your experiences, but I guess it's about that, about that feedback and that learning for the schools and, and making life perhaps easier for other trainee teachers when they go into those establishments. So I've had nothing formal um, with my school, but they've been more than willing for me to sit down and say, I've kind of had little problems with this. You could have maybe looked at helping with this a little bit more. And the schools generally are more, the schools have to sign up to be a placement. So they're willing to take on your advice of you could change whatever it is that needs changed. Um, I found that teachers are generally quite, quite interested to hear your feedback that way. And do you know if they take on board that feedback? I don't personally know if they go on. I know other people's, uh, other students do go to those schools, but we've never really got into talking about the net gritty off okay. if they because change certain aspects. Because I suppose what, what I'm hearing today is, is, is you're saying that actually the most valuable part of your training is being in school placement. So that needs to be high quality. That needs to be a, a, a positive experience if you're going to go on and, and replicate those skills that you learn there. So. Placement experience varies from department to department within the school. Um, I went to a Renfrewshire school and had a fantastic placement with really supportive staff. The whole staff in the department were very supportive. However, um, three other girls on placement were in another department and they had a terrible time. They didn't... Um, they weren't encouraged by their mentor to speak up, to ask for work, to ask for um, feedback from staff, things like that where I was. Um, my mentor was part-time and I didn't actually meet her till the third day that I was there, but the PT made herself available when the mentor wasn't. Um, so it can, it can vary. Um, I was English. They were modern studies and history, so it can vary department to department within the school. Okay. Gillian, you wanted to come in for a brief supplementary. From my own experience, having, having and done a, a teaching qualification and, and other people in my family, I know that at the end of your placement, the crit is a it nods of recognition um, and experience in itself. And I'd just like to ask you what your um, feelings are and how useful the crit process is and how much you get out of that because it maybe follows on from Claire's questioning around the, the feedbacks there's actually that official crit that comes from your tutor and the school how useful is that as you progress forward yeah. it's fantastic sorry. I'll take Halla first and then I'll go to, to Cara if that's okay hey, Cara, sorry. I think it's fantastically useful and um, the particularly because the, your tutor doesn't come in at the end of your placement, your tutor comes in midway through your placement. So if there are any areas of concern, those are flagged up, and you've then got the rest of your placement to improve those and get them to the satisfactory rate. My only suggestion would be, and this has come not just from me, but from my peers and everyone else within the final year sort of B. Ed teaching cohort, that with the possibility of grading placement might be, might be quite a good one, because... Our, our marks are basically what determines your, how good you are as a teacher is how good you are at writing an essay. And all you have to do is go to a placement school and pass, you either pass or fail. Whereas surely that should be the sort of true sort of recognition of how good you are at teaching. Okay, Karis, you wanted to say something. Yeah, in our six week placement, we had a formative crit and a summative crit. So in our formative one, like we were told where we could improve and 
I don't know if you guys have the dreaded folders. Um, we had them. <laughs> um, so she, she would look at that while you were teaching, but she'd also be observing your teaching too. Um, so you knew exactly what you needed to do for your summative. Um, and we were assessed against the SPRs, um, which I thought was quite good as well, um, which the tutor would fill in and your classroom teacher, because your classroom teacher would obviously see you more than your university tutor would. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, sorry, Joanne. Just to, I'm interested in your experience of, of your placements and reflecting back when a million years ago, um, when I did my teacher training, the most important thing was to make sure the, the urn didn't burn out. We were going to keep in with the rest of the staff. But uh, my understanding is that it's much more formalised. And my very first teaching experience was to go in to be told the teacher who was supposed to be sporting me was off, and would I just take the classes? Um, and I wonder whether, because it has been more formalised, do you... Have you got an expectation when you go on your placement how much time you'll be observing, how much time you actually, what expectations the school might have of you and what expectations you have of them, and how explicit is that? Um, certainly at Murray House, each um, mentor is handed a, a pack at the start, and that outlines the time that you should be spending teaching, the number of periods a week. It also explicitly states that you should not be treated as a cover teacher. Mm -hmm. um, although that can something happen, but in a would you mind taking this class, there will be a cover teacher with you, which, and they're willing for you to say no, but it's not a problem. My main concern with the placement so the system is the actual allocation of placements. Um, I found that on two of the occasions that I've been in placement, I've been told on the Thursday and then the Wednesday prior to starting on the Monday. This does not give me the chance, and these are both weeks that we've had assignments during on the Friday. So you can imagine this, the stress that this adds to teachers who maybe can't, yeah, they just can't get into the schools in time. So it's always nice to get into your school beforehand, meet the teachers, sort out your timetable so you know what to expect when you go in on the Monday. Uh, on my second placement, I wasn't even able to go and visit my school beforehand. And I think compared to my other two placements, it took me a lot longer to get up and running within the department. It ended up taking about four days for us to finalise my actual timetable, which is effectively a week wasted. Can I ask, have you had an explanation of why that happened? Did the school know you were coming? On that particular occasion, on my second placement, um, I was shunted about from pillar to post. I was told I'd be going to four different schools over the time before finally settling on Thursday to go down to the school that I went down to. The school also were only told on the Thursday that was when it was all confirmed and found out. Um, but I believe that Money House, I don't know how the rest of the university do it, uses the General Teaching Council. They have a system which they pay to use, and which for me, the main sort of stakeholder in this should be the student teacher, to make sure the student teacher gets up to this good start to the experience. It is not serving, or in my opinion, and within speaking to, from a couple of other people from Money House, it is not serving student teachers well at all. You're getting student teachers who are placed a couple of hour drive away from their placement. Edinburgh Uni are then having to source accommodation or possibly rental cars for people. This is all just adding to additional stress that student teachers don't need during this six week, five week placement that we have in schools. And there's no reimbursement for you in terms of cost to you to, I mean, this is a big change, I think, I mean, from Travel. my lifetime, but if you're, if you're Travelling, I notice it's a 90 minute commute, which seems quite a lot. If you were only getting told on a Friday for something on Monday, perhaps just logistically that would be a challenge, but there's not reimbursement or expenses or anything. Murray House do, do uh, reimbursement for expenses. So there's mileage, or if you can get there within 90 minutes, you will get the public transport money back. So there is, but it's all waited until the end. You can't put in advanced expenses claims. So I know of students in my uh, technologies class who have ended up being almost in debt mm -hmm. because they've spent all this money on transport, which they don't have because we're going a year without any money coming in. And then at the end, you're getting this big lump sum. But it could be done with being paid up front or on a sort of staged basis as they're actually using it. Okay. William. Yeah, I would like to, to add, I can relate to, to what Mark's saying. I can unfortunately go, go one better, uh, although my... Uh, I, I knew where my placement schools were going to be. There were others on my course. The first day of placement, they were in college because they had not been told. I can also relate stories of uh, 
uh, student teachers who didn't have their driving license, who had a, they could still attend a good number of schools, but this didn't seem to be taken into consideration. Uh, and when you live in a rural area, as I do, then ensuring that uh, suitable students get the opportunity to go to schools that they can actually reach uh, should be should be critical. Uh, I, I think secondary schools, rural secondary schools. Uh, I am I live in the Isle of Lewis. Uh, I ended up going to Ullapool, and uh, the the costs and the time involved. Uh, there is no official method. Uh, for students at UHI to claim back any travel expenses. No, n nothing. Nothing for accommodation, nothing for travel. Okay. Aye. Kimberly, can we start? Uh, staff guide um, will pay you the difference between travelling to uni and the extra that it costs you to travel to the school. And that, again, is done at the end of placement. Nothing up front. Just to say, I think there's something that we would want to maybe be asking other folk. It does feel to me it's just simply an administrative thing. I can't understand why it's so complex and unhelpful in terms of your professional development. You're not even able to plan ahead and the school's not able to plan ahead. It's a problem for both of you. But thank you. Tabish, you wanted to come yeah. in. Can I just ask one supplementary, Mark? Um, uh, did you have to arrange the placement with the GD? I mean, in terms of this shambles of a situation that you've, just, you've all described, did you have to do, do that directly with GTS, or who actually did the, the practicalities or did not do the practicalities of this exercise? So Murray House have a, an administrator who deals with purely deals with the placement system. Um, but from what we've been told, the, she has very little input to it. She's almost just there to needle the GTC, who are the ones that actually run the system. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a great deal, like you say, it's or giant, It's a pretty much an administrative system that I don't understand why it can work. be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But so she's aware of this, and uh, and that's one of the, the points where he's trying to get the GTCS and the universities to get to get some, knock their heads together and get this sorted because it just seems completely, utterly ludicrous. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, Ross. Um, thank you very much. Um, in the region that I, um, that I represent, uh, which is the north east of Scotland, um, we are still struggling to recruit and retain teachers. Um, so in Aberdeen alone, we still have over 200 vacancies in primary and secondary school, which is uh, <coughs> significant. But we've been struggling to recruit people in to fill them, um, particularly um, students or those who are looking for permanent places. Despite putting in financial incentive as well to say, you know, we can give you an upfront sum if you take on the role. So, when you're studying and you're looking to your permanent placement, what are, what are the barriers to taking up a permanent placement? What would be the barriers, um, for example, for coming up to the North East as well? Because um, I know we've struggled to really recruit from the central belt. Yeah. I, I think, I th I think the, the biggest barrier is the, the fact that uh, the people who are likely to be the stablest are those who have already experienced the, the corporate world and they want to settle down. You want to be a teacher because you like working with kids, you like the holidays, and you like stability. Uh, if you have not already decided to be a teacher young, then you've probably found yourself with kids and a mortgage. How can you take time out? How can you lose a year of salary? Unless you have uh, a partner who's willing to go out and work, in which case then you've got huge childcare costs potentially. How do you get into teaching? Uh, you need to be paid for the PGDE year. And I don't know if you're aware, but the, I work for the Western Isles Council. They're actually paying me to go through this year, which is the only way that I could even begin to, to go through. And likewise, they've guaranteed me a probation within the local authority and employment after that. I think when you have somebody who's thinking about becoming a teacher, then... The, it's a nice idea, but 90% will take it no further because of the financial barriers. Um, the cost of living as well, um, in relation to obviously the, the salary you get, but it still doesn't meet, for example, if you wanted to come up to, I'll just say Aberdeen, um, the cost of housing, <laughs> uh, <laughs> cost of, uh, sort of rent, mortgage, transport, travel, um, are these all considerations that you think put people off? 
What, what are, we are we talking about students going in for PGDE, or are you talking about... No, I'm talking about you're looking for your permanent place. So when you're doing your training, they're looking for your, you know, your school to, to settle and to, to work I think I think you need to look to focus beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think the way the Western Isles Council is doing it is the way to go. Don't, don't look for teachers. Look for people who beca can be become teachers mm -hmm. and uh, pay them to go through that, that stage, because there aren't the tech, the tech teachers out there. There's mm -hmm. no point in offering somebody a couple of thousand pounds okay. to, to try and steal them away, if you like, from somewhere sure. else. You know, I think uh, the, the, the principles of the Christie re principles of reform there, build the talent <coughs> up, look locally, mm. find people who already live there and put them through the PGD. Okay. Um, as someone who has just fills out, along with the rest of my year, the options courses for where we want to be next year, the majority of people have chosen Edinburgh and the Lothians and either Falkirk or Fife because they're close to Edinburgh. Because we've studied in Edinburgh, we've got this now, this network of friends and people in, that we know. So to get up and move to the northeast, to the highlands, to somewhere where they are in more need of teachers is quite a terrifying prospect when you've got this this way of life that you know. So I think for young people, there would need to be some sort of... We've done all our teaching placements in Edinburgh. Edinburgh is all we know in terms of teaching. But if there were some sort of, sort of I don't know, council fair where your local authority came down and shared these are the benefits of living here, this is some nice stuff, and gave you an idea of what life might be like, there could be some sort of, oh, actually, that looks really nice. I wouldn't mind living there. But to go, where in Scotland do you want to go? everyone goes, we want to go in the place we know, we want to stay in Edinburgh, because it's what you know, it's not so scary. So do you think it's more about selling the place? Yeah, I, or think, do I think so. I don't, I don't know anyone who hasn't selected for their options course. There's four mm. people out of about, I think it's about 100, who have ticked the go anywhere in Scotland box. And the, um, the majority of people have put Edinburgh, the Mid East, West, Lothian, and either Falkirk or Fife in the hope that we'll stay in Edinburgh. And then some other people, if they grew up in Glasgow, have put Glasgow as an option. If they grew up in Aberdeen, might select Aberdeen as an option. But it is about going with what you know. You wanted to... I feel that I need to say Aberdeenshire is beautiful at this time of year. We have we have humpback whales on our beaches. We have mountains where we have access to skiing. Um, no, and, and it really follows on from, from what Helen was saying. Um, there's... There's a, a case around having fast-tracked courses in order to... So it comes back to the, the issues that, that, that Willie was saying about people getting people who maybe come from other sectors into teaching and recognising that have the family responsibilities. But Hal has mentioned as well, what other incentives would housing, maybe be supported housing for, for that first couple of years? I know that some local authorities have offered that. Would that make a difference? Um, you know, in, in terms of there were some regions that actually, some local authorities that maybe offered help with accommodation, particularly in those high cost areas. I'm just interested in, in what you think. I feel like a lot of people in my course are my age, I'm 19. Um, so the thought of having to get up and move so far away from your family might be quite nerve wracking for a lot of people. Um, I think that does have quite a big influence on where people might choose. A lot of people would maybe choose to go home. Um, because they could live at home again and it wouldn't be as expensive as renting as somewhere like Aberdeen. And humpback whales, so we'll, we'll, we'll I'll speak keep it about that later. <laughs> <laughs> Hala, uh, the, just ignore her. <laughs> <laughs> the Teach First scheme um, sends you off to a school, you don't get a choice. And I've got a few friends who are going off to do that now in England, they've been sent away to the schools that need them most. So perhaps actually having the choice, which we all like having the choice, but ha maybe having the choice is actually not really viable. If you want, if you need the teachers, maybe you need to go for your probation year because it's a guaranteed job. Maybe we just need to be sent off somewhere and go, this is where you are for a year. It's a year you can enjoy it or <laughs> make the most of it. <laughs> Funny enough, as soon as you said that, two hands went straight up there. Uh, William then, Mark. I think you see here the difference between the, the, the elders the elders and the youngers. Uh, I, I can fully understand you're young, you want to get out, you want to experience it. But uh, for anyone who's not in that position, anyone who has children and what have you, you have to take into account that uh, it's, uh, yeah, you, you've lost half the workforce, maybe even more. Yeah, I'd echo those points as well. well if, I was giving, if I was giving a placement, or a placement, a sort of preparation a year up in 
Aberdeen, which I'm sure is lovely, but from Portobello, I've got beaches as well. It's fine. <laughs> Much better, you're right. The, um, yeah, I would end up probably dropping out and trying to find a job rather than... For me, you've got to look at where you're recruiting teachers from. Who up in Aberdeenshire is running postgraduate courses, is running uh, the BA Ed courses? You need to take teachers from that part of Scotland already, potential teachers, train them up there. Because people, if people come down to here, if they're from Edinburgh, we're already seeing it. There's not a great chance that they'll go up there. You need to be sourcing people from up there, I'd have thought. I mean, it's not really that far right enough. No. Uh, OK, uh, Colin? Thank you, um, I'd like to move a little bit at uh, some of the issues around retention of teachers. And I'm, I'm looking particularly at a, a phrase here that I'm not terribly sure I'm understanding properly. And Hala, you uh, put a submission in and you said uh, the stigma of teachers not be, being not very academic was a demotivating factor. What, what did you mean by that? What I mean by that is I mentioned earlier that I personally was discouraged from doing a B.Ed. from becoming a teacher because I got told you're too bright to be a teacher by my own teachers, which is uh, it was a bit ironic. But there is, there is this perception of, particularly among my peers, I mean, Edinburgh is a very academic university, but the B.Ed. primary course isn't regarded as a real course. You go to, you go and meet people and they you go, what are you studying? You, I go, primary teacher, and they go, oh, right, okay. And there's this perception that because you're a primary teacher, you can't engage with sort of political conversations, you can't engage with real world issues because it is entirely, it's entirely stigmatised and probably with the makeup of Edinburgh University it, where there is, there's this very academic focus, there is, I can understand that it might be more of an imbalance. Um, but there isn't, teachers are not regarded by the majority of, I don't know, sort of my equivalents at Edinburgh University by people older than me as it being as valuable a profession as it is. There's, there's not the recognition that teaching is actually an incredible, the influential and important position, which I don't, I don't know where that's been lost, but I don't think that teachers are valued enough. Colin comes back in. Just to uh, let you know, this is the last question for yourselves. You'll be delighted to know. <laughs> uh, so if you have any comments you want to make in response to them, this is an opportunity to do so. Certainly, I have to say, it's interesting hearing this, I have to say, among the general public that I mix with, I've not heard this uh, qualification before, this, this, this uh, concern before, nor have any teachers raised it. And I, I do visit quite a lot of schools, so I'm, I'm interested to see where this is coming from. Is it the perception of the university rather than maybe the public? Perhaps, yes. Um, there, is, there is this sort of... I think I found with people on the year below me who are doing the MA, where the Murray House is working in collaboration with other, um, like other parts of the university, there doesn't seem to be the collaboration and the primary education part of your degree. So it's primary education with history, primary education with physics, and the primary education part isn't, isn't really recognised by the other has of the university. I don't, I, it's, it is, perhaps it is just the young people and there is this sort of like stigma yeah. that if, we, if you go to a party and you go, I'm a primary teacher, everyone looks down on you a bit. And that is something that I would say that the, the other peers on my course would say there, there is definitely a feeling of detachment. Murray House isn't part of Edinburgh University. Murray House is Murray House and Edinburgh University is Edinburgh University. There is that feeling. Just moving on from that, um, there's a recurrent theme here about pay. Maybe, maybe the panel would like to comment on that, about pay levels. Especially within the PGDE, um, I took, coming from industry, a private sort of industry, I took a significant hint on my wages to move into teaching, which I'll never recover unless I get up to department head level. Um, I don't think up at the, high, the sort of higher end, sort of six years in, it's too bad. I think the lower scale, you're really struggling. The, no money in the PGDE year, I think. When you look at nurses get bursaries, I think you should be looking at some sort of bursary scheme for teachers. Um, and your, your probationary year as well, it's about £22,000, £23,000. That's not going to attract anybody that's... People say the high flyers, those that come out with their top degrees. They're going to be headhunted by private companies. They're going to be looked at by people who are able to offer them significantly more money 
than what the Scottish Government is offering. And while I accept that, as a public servant, you will not earn as much as in the private, I think we, you could probably look at something a little bit higher than what's there just now. So does, does the rest of the panel agree that... Sorry. In front of us are people who are keen to be teachers and uh, are clearly very intelligent people who could get a, a career elsewhere. Yeah, a panel of five. Well, that's because that's a panel of five that we selected. That's you're not, right, the, only, but not the only five people in Scotland that decided to become teachers. You're right, but you could have a look and see how many people are deciding on coming out with degrees that could be quite easily changed into becoming teachers through postgrad or going on through the B.Ed. that are not choosing to go down that route. I was turned down from teaching physics um, at Edinburgh University purely because I did not have any units for optics within my degree. I had worked for seven years in the Laser Centre of Excellence, which is <laughs> purely working with optics. Oh. And I was turned down because it was not part of this degree. You've got people coming out with degrees who don't have higher English who are getting turned down for going into PGDE courses. It's yeah, time well, we're now we... talking about two different things. To be fair, we're now talking about two different things. You were talking about salaries. We're now talking about some of the inconsistencies round about uh, the, the process. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. It sounds ludicrous. Uh, sorry, Colin, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to ask if the, if the rest of the panel agreed with what Mark's saying about it's the early years salary that's the real problem, and that in the later period, the, or, or after five or six years, the salaries are reasonably competitive. Uh, just to kind of broaden this a little bit, still sticking with the pay. You've already heard my views that uh, you should be paid for the PGDE year. Uh, I believe that you should have an introduction to teaching year before that where you're effectively working as a classroom assistant. But at the same time, you're familiarising yourself with the course content. You might even be achieving qualifications. Uh, so I believe that you should be paid as a year one as a classroom assistant type role, year two as a PGDE and then into probation. I do not think that you should try going down the line of competing with industry because you can't. Industry will always pay more than teaching. But industry does not have the benefits. We've already talked about the holidays. We've already talked about the opportunity to, to, to teach children. You've already talked about uh, the potential for a, a structured career progression, stable employment. These are things which are attracting us, not, not high wage. Don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing for lower wages. But I am... I, I am agreeing with Mark that the focus needs to be at the beginning because if, you, if, if you're in a position where you're middle age and you're going through PGDE, somebody's supporting you. Okay, so if you decide that the teaching is not for you, you can walk because whoever's supporting you through the PGDE is they, they've clearly ma making enough money that you can go and do something else as well. Um, I kind of. I don't disagree, um, but I feel that we are actually quite lucky that we're graduating from university and going into a salary. Um, there are a lot of people that have done degrees and they can't find jobs after it. So I believe that teaching is really good that we do get the salary from it, um, from such a young age. I think that as a young person about to start a paid year of work, the starting salary, if you are young, you have no family, you have no commitments. Particularly, there are many people I know who are living at home next year as well. I think that starting salary is quite good. And However, what I'm actually concerned about is what happens when you reach the top of the pay bracket? What then is there to motivate you to stay in the profession? Because as much as I love teaching, I don't think I will teach for the rest of my life. Because once there needs to be some opportunity for progression which is regarding promotion, which came up with uh, several of the submissions that came in. What is the issue about promotion? I'm not aware of any issues with promotion. I've seen people move up through the schools. Thank you. Yeah. OK. And, uh, on that note, I'll draw this session to a close. Can I... Sincerely, thank you for that. That was a very, very interesting panel. With, uh, lots of <laughs> See, you wouldn't get that in industry. So, <laughs> get to the classroom. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but seriously, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll be taking great cognizance of what you were, you were telling us today. Thank you very much. And we'll have a short break now until we, we change panels.
I welcome the next panel, which is a group of teachers. The committee wanted to hear a range of perspectives, and so we're very pleased to have before us a wide range of experience, including a Gaelic medium teacher, head teacher, supply teacher, and teachers from primary and secondary school. Before we begin, can I thank you for taking the time to respond to the committee's request for views through its questionnaire and for agreeing to give evidence. As I said to the first panel, this is very much an information gathering session to inform the committee's scrutiny, and we appreciate your sharing personal experiences. So please only answer questions you're comfortable responding to. In addition, given the number of people we are hearing from today and the size of this committee, members will try to ask questions of specific attendees where possible, so you don't have to answer every question. And please, given how many of you there are, please don't try and answer every question, uh, especially if someone else has covered that point. You also have the option of sending written comments after your session if there's anything that you do not get a chance to convey today. That said, can I now welcome Emma Newton, teacher, Isabel Marshall, head teacher, Judith Williams, teacher, Karen Vaughan, teacher, Angela Kelly, teacher, Linda Robertson, teacher, Dr Sean Harley, teacher, and Christor Pendergrast, who's a teacher. A standard I'll kick off with the first question which was the same first question as I asked that very impressive panel that we had before. Could you tell us what your motivation was for becoming a teacher? Who wishes to start? Uh, Judith? Children. Children. Yeah. I, I always wanted to be a teacher from about the age of seven and oh. just working with children. No day is the same, no hour is the same. You're never looking at your watch to see when the coffee break is. You're always looking at your watch to see how much more can I fit in before the coffee break comes. So it's a great variety, the children and your colleagues. Yes. OK, thank you very much. Uh, sure. Yeah, I was um, brought and educated by the Maris brothers. And at one point, I was sort of following that line. And I saw the sort of vocational element of that. And while I didn't become a Maris brother myself, eventually, I. I pursued that line because I thought it was a worthwhile pathway to, you know, plan my life with. Right. Well, and again, it was all about teaching young people and inspiring them and helping them to develop. Thank you. Uh, Linda? Um, well, I was at a crossroads in my life um, and I decided that there was actually maybe more to life than make, making money um, and working for somebody that makes money. Um, so I decided that at that point that I might go and try something different. So I am a newly qualified teacher. All right, great stuff. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to comment? As well? I became a teacher because I loved the head teacher that I had when I was at primary school. I went to a small primary school and I was very interested by what he did. He was very enthusiastic about his job. He spoke about his jobs around the world um, and I saw it as a, a great career, um, coming from a background where nobody had that experience, he really inspired me. And I still keep in touch with my original head teacher from, from primary school. It's amazing how often we hear that you know, a teacher inspired others to do the same thing. Hey, Karen, you wanted to come in? Um, I was going to be perfectly honest and say that I came through a computing degree um, and uh, I soon realised towards the end of it that um, I wasn't a true computing geek after all and more of a people person. And I was a kind of, where do I go from here? And, of course, the default fallback was, oh, become a teacher. So, hands up, I did do that um, for the sake of not having another clear direction. However, very shortly into my career, um, I did realise uh, that there were a lot of kids there that needed help, that no one else was going to help. Um, and uh, I, I was very much always being drawn to the the more challenging areas of, of teaching. So not the kind of general masses, but the ones where we, we don't get it right for them. Yeah. Um, so can I just ask you a personal level, were you delighted to find out you weren't a geek and you were a people person? Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Angela, did you have your hand up there? Um, I actually had a, a bit of a negative experience in one year when I was in primary five. And the teacher actually was a, a friend of my parents outside of work. Um, and as a result, I was a, I was a hesitant reader and I was asked to read onto a tape every night at home and it would be played in class the next day. And the children had to put their hands on their head whenever I hesitated. And this was supposed to help me become less of a hesitant reader and speaker. Following that, my younger brother, four years later, had the same teacher. Um, and he had been diagnosed with dyslexic, dyslexia, band B, which is not terribly serious, but 
serious enough. And he had a horrendous time with that same <coughs> teacher. Now, although my parents had gone to the council and head teacher, etc., nothing really moved at that time. That was when I became very interested in additional support needs and how those children who maybe don't are not top of the class and maybe don't shine and haven't got confidence and self-worth, how do you bring those children to the forefront? And who will be their advocate if they can't speak for themselves? And that was why I felt very driven uh, into, towards teaching. I'm sure Ross will have some questions for you later on round about that. But that's, that's, that's really interesting. Christopher. Yeah, just quite similar to other people as well. I think the motivation to work with young people is fantastic. Um, I think it's a real privilege to be able to work with young people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just the energy and the kind of enthusiasm they've got for life and their studies is really infectious. Um, the other thing, similar to what other people were saying, was, was two teachers in particular, um, through my own experience, my art teacher and my technical teacher, that were a massive inspiration to me. Um, I'm dyslexic as well, and... Uh, for me, it was a big thing to be able to, to see that I was successful at something. I wasn't struggling. I was always quite slow at reading at school and I always felt a bit of pressure. And I felt when I was doing those subjects that um, a bit of weight was taken off my shoulders. So I quite enjoyed um, being able to help other young people do that as well. And particularly um, in my sector, being a Gaelic medium teacher, um, the motivation to try and promote Gaelic and try and instill the enthusiasm that I've got for the language and the pride in the language into young people is massively important. Yeah, fantastic. A wide variety of, of reasons, but all with children at the heart of them. That's, that's great. Colin? Um, I guess the first question really should be about uh, uh, retention of teachers. What factors are f making teachers take decisions to retire early or to leave the, leave the service? Uh, and what, what, would, what would encourage them to stay? I have been teaching for 33 years. I've been a head teacher for the last 12. Um, I have thoroughly loved my career, but I've resigned and I leave in six weeks. Um, I have loved it. I would advise anybody to go into it as a career, but I am utterly exhausted. And it's been the breadth of social and emotional demands, as well as the management demands on me, which have reached that point where I feel that I need to have a break. Um, social demands. Maybe expand on that a little. You're, you're interacting with, as well as the interaction with the teachers, it's interacting with families, often families who are quite in, in ex extreme difficulties themselves. That has a social and emotional impact on you. Um, also, the social demands within education. I think to be part of a, an education or part of a school now it calls upon you to be involved in the wider community, and that can interact. That, that can cause you to be really pulled upon in lots of different ways for social events, after school, at evenings, events. But that's all part of part, part and parcel of building the community, which is important. But it is also quite exhausting. Um, so, uh, other teachers now, I, I feel guilty in many ways that other teachers look at me and say. I think you do a good job, but I wouldn't want your job. So I think what we need to do is try to re redress that. And when I'm saying that I became a teacher because I saw other, uh, another teacher who influenced me, I need to do that positively in the other way as well. But, but it's but generally the work-life balance, I think, that's out but, of kilter. What would have made you take a different decision? Uh, chance to stop, refresh, um, share the workload, reduce the workload. Is that a discussion you've had with... Uh Local uh, local uh, education authority. It is yes. Um, and, you're, and you're still leaving. Yeah, I, I am. Um, I had considered a year's career break, but at the end of that, I think that would have left a school that was kind of hanging and not really knowing where we were going. Um, but a few years ago, a career break would have been helpful, um, just to refresh, to go somewhere else, to see other things that are happening. Um, then. It, it, financially, it didn't suit me because I'm the main wage earner in my house. Yeah, and I've got children who've just gone to university, and that obviously has demands on you as well. Oh, I know how much, exp <laughs> how much expense it is. Uh, sorry, it was Angela, and then. Um, having spoken to colleagues who are in middle management level, um, several of us feel that what we are, what has been asked of us, is no longer sustainable. Um, we feel that we are not seen as professionals, we are not trusted as professionals. We are left to be, we're very, very highly accountable for everything that we do. 
So if, for instance, we attend a twilight session in my local authority, there are very few training courses now that take place during, during the school day. You have to attend that after your working day. Um, if you attend a course, you're then expected to train the staff at, back at your workplace on what you have learned. Then you have to go into your DTC update and you have to talk about action and impact of having benefited from that training through your council. So that takes a lot of time to be typing it up. Then in order to actually have the action and impact take place, you're getting a working party together. So that three or four hours twilight that you've already done out of your in your own time. Um, you're then having to build on that and there's more and more demands to the point that I've got staff saying, I'd actually rather not go on that course because they know that going on the course is not just organising the childcare for them to be able to do that after work, that there's then going to be this continued pile up of work and responsibility put upon them. Um, also, some staff who have then done that successfully had very good CAT training in-house with their staff. Other primary schools from the learning community have then said, would you come and deliver in our school? So it builds again and again and again. And there are no benefits. There are, there's no one coming saying, thank you very much. We value what you have done. There is nobody coming back to say that to you. It's very much presumed that you have this unlimited amount of time at your disposal to do this, and that's out well out with your 35 hour week. There clearly are benefits, it's just that there's no benefits. No benefits back to, to you. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. You said you're not seen as professional. No. Yeah. By whom? The community? By the authority? The community in general, actually. I started teaching 15 years ago, um, and I'm now back in the same school that I started teaching in as principal teacher. The, even the approach of parents towards teachers can vary from school to school, but there is actually a lack of respect um, towards teachers and particularly middle management and senior management. And what some of my colleagues have commented on was uh, nearly a decade ago when uh, head teachers had to begin introducing themselves and, and allow their staff to call them by their first name, that actually a lot of parents then took that on. And, you know, head teachers are addressed by their first name across the playground by parents. They also seem parents um, are, have every right to come in and question about their child's education and what's happening and if something's gone wrong. But increasingly, we're seeing parents arriving on the doorstep expecting to be facilitated in an appointment right then and right there. Um, and different schools have different processes for how that's dealt with, but there is a lack of consistency where we've had children come to our school and the parents said, well, the previous head teacher always would speak, see me immediately. So there's, there's a lack of consistency in how issues are addressed in schools, whether head teachers should be providing appointments on the spot or whether they should be made giving yeah, a time frame for parents to cool off or whatever may, 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 be necessary, may be necessary. But we are finding parents coming in and, and quite demanding of parents' time or senior management's time, forgetting that actually those teachers should be in class teaching and that the time for appointments should be out of school hours. Okay. Um, again, the time for appointment for out of school hours, if I could just bring it up with Ross, the, the paperwork for ASN children. As you quite rightly say, there's one in four in every class. And I've, in my experience, actually, there's, there's slightly more than that. Um, the paperwork for identifying a child's need and making sure then the teacher knows how to work with that and provide a learning programme for those children. It's a huge, immense task. And the teachers are not... You can be trained in autism. You can have gone to a course on autism. But every child with autism has different needs. And their spectrum of needs can be immense. And often the needs of the parent is also immense. So the time that teacher then has to take in making sure the parent is fully informed in what you hope to achieve with that child, what they can be doing at home to support their child through that, that's, again, hours and hours worth of paperwork, discussion, feedback that is not taken into account. Board overall. It's, it's overwhelming. Um, and I think often many staff are feeling like they're juggling and they're not trying to prioritise is becoming more and more difficult um, because there are so many high priorities and you, you don't know which one to tackle first or which one can be left for a few days. Okay. 
for you, Richard. Linda, you want to come in. Can, can I just ask, sorry, but can I just ask that we try and keep our answers a bit shorter and also that we don't repeat the answers that somebody else has given us because we have got a lot to get through. To well, I just wanted to back it up and say coming from industry, um, I have never worked so hard teaching. You just don't, and I can't imagine working till 67 at that level. Um, some days you just can't even go to the toilet or have lunch. I mean, it's that. So to be at 65, I can't imagine working at that level. So I don't, that's why you can't keep teachers. That, uh, uh, Emma, you were wanting to come in there. I mean, I spoke to my colleagues before I came and they, they all said that none of them w will work till they're 67. Most of them can't see themselves working past the next five or ten years. And it is the workload and the stress. Um, in my particular school, we've had changing management and that's resulted in changing um, curriculum models, changing planning methods, ch everything's changing. So this year's been a bit of a flux year, but the expectations are so huge. You could work, I mean, I could work 100 hours a week and I wouldn't get it all done to the level that I would be happy with. And you have to draw a line. Um, I mean, I can't see how I would continue working full time till I was 67. It, it just won't happen. Okay, uh, thank you. Karen? Uh, you're a supply teacher, I believe. Yeah. Um, I am, yeah. I've worked full-time at various points in my life and I've worked part-time at various points in life and uh, I've had career breaks to industry as well. Um, I have actually made the conscious decision uh, more recently that I refuse to work full-time because it's not sustainable from a health point of view, from a family point of view. It's not about the money, um, not about the money. Um, it's really a case of I want full-time, uh, sorry, part-time permanent work and believe it or not I'm actually really struggling to do to find that um, and that may be an option that I might not be able to to keep in teaching because that full time is just not an option um, for stress and burnout as everyone said. So there's, there's a struggle with part-time permanent work like it's a job share type thing for yeah, all right. Yeah, maybe, I've, maybe I've said a bad word, but, but, but you know what I mean? That if, for a teacher to be in for a, a part of the week and then another teacher to be in for the other part of the week. If that generally, there's very few cases of it working. But again, I think it does vary greatly from authority to authority. So, um, but again, with a family, I can't go to another authority. So um, you're kind of limited. I'm not hearing that the salary is the top issue here. It's, it's really the workload. Do you think the remuneration is adequate at, at, at your levels? But I let Judith come in first, please. On the, on the last point, that yeah. I've had a very different experience from Angela. I've been in the same job share for 17 years in primary, and I think that's why I'm still teaching, is because I've been able to have that balance between my home life and my school life. Um, and the fact I've been sharing with the same person makes a huge difference because obviously we, we know each other very well. But the workload is, is a huge issue, and I think the fact that the curriculum for excellence changes regularly there is no stability there is doesn't seem to be a long-term political strategic planning we seem to be reacting with short-term ideas where tons of money are thrown in and we're all expected to learn them and embed them but then the next one comes along before we've had a chance to catch our breath so for me that's a huge issue within teacher retention that I'm just not sure I can put up with another curriculum change, another new initiative. Oh, look, we're coming round again to that one. That one happened about 15 years ago, you know. Here in two weeks, so we'll certainly be asking them about which yeah. plans are for a stable programme. Uh, Sean? Um, I think, just to echo that point, it's the, it's the problem of change and direction and um, possibly leadership, and I don't mean necessarily within the school and beyond that, I'm talking about like SQA and, and whoever's making the decisions around curriculum for excellence. And it's not that I would say teachers have an issue with change particularly, but they want change that makes sense. They, because they are clever, intelligent, rational, professional people, and they feel that this change is actually taken away from all the things that you've heard so far from this panel and the previous panel of witnesses and that they want to be in the classroom and that change is taking them away from the classroom and it's change after change. And by the way, even though there are changes, 
we still have to change more because it's still not right. And they, they, are, they are seeing the prospect of further change and they're saying, look, I'm backing off from this because I'm at the point now where I've got you know, enough, perhaps my pension plan will, will sit nicely, I can leave, and that might be why people at the top end of the age range are thinking of leaving. Um, and also another thing I would suggest is to do with the salary in relation to um, opportunity for promotion. When Macron came in, they, you know, they took away the principal teachers and the assistant principal teachers, and then they moved to, um, they moved to uh, faculties and faculty heads. Now, that was a major change in my school, was one of the first to do that. The implications of that in relation to the workload is, for example, I am in charge of a, a technology faculty. I've got computing, I've got what, what we call techie, um, we've got um, business. So I'm in charge of something like 17 to 20 different courses. Now that's my business to manage, requisition, deal with teachers, probation of teachers, um, uh, student teachers coming in, and all the other things that go with it, and then the change, and then you put in place a change, and then there's another change, and on and on it goes. And as one person pointed out, absolutely no way would that fit into our contractual hours. And if teachers pull back from that, most of these things, which they're trying really hard to try and keep up with, in the trust that it's going to come right, um, you know, if they were to pull out from that, you know, these changes would just fall flat in their face. So there's a lot of fantastic goodwill by teachers to try to deal with the workload issues and the possibility of not getting promoted on because the people aren't there to do it. So that's money and workload. Okay. Uh, just before I move on to, to uh, Tavish, obviously there's a number of, of issues have been raised here. What method is there of you being able to raise these issues with your education authority, you know, further up the chain and then get some response to see, you know, for them, A, to recognise the unhappiness of what you're talking about and B, for them to respond to it. I wonder. I actually raised issues with my union representative and that, that for me is the way that it's gone. So there's huge changes just been made to National 5 Computing Science for 2017-18. And 2017-18 curriculum will start in my school three weeks' time. So um, <clears throat> it's difficult because everybody's so busy. Where do you go? And everybody's aware of it, but teachers are so used to the changes going through that they're just, they just cope with it and they try and manage it themselves, okay. which coming from industry isn't the, the, isn't the right way of doing it. I can see that it should be getting project managed somewhere, yeah, yeah. but it's not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Emma, then Angela, then Crystal. Um, I, my union as well, my union have a, um, a system where you can record the hours you work every week and then they then take that back and every year we hear that we work more and more hours but there's no shift top down. Nobody's saying, right, well, what can we do? Nobody's saying, how can we reduce your workload? All they're doing is giving us more changes and more workload and more expectations. But what do the... the, the so, I, I suppose the point I was trying to make then is, uh, if it's a union that you're speaking to, what do the union do with the information that you've given them? Who do they go to speak to? They come to the meetings like this with you and with but, but COSLA would, and... Would it not be... Uh, would their immediate place of uh, port of call not be the Education Authority? But it's the same across the whole of Scotland. This is not, it's not unique to my school or to your schools, it's the same across the whole of Scotland. Every teacher, whether they be primary or secondary, the expectations on what you do are huge. And as Isabel said, we have a social element now to what we do. Um, I will quite frequently be in conversations with parents at six or seven o'clock at night um, about issues that they, they have with their children, which really have nothing to do with me as a teacher, but they feel that as the child's teacher, I should be able to solve these problems. Um, so there, there are methods for us to report this. It's just it seems to get to a certain level and then nothing's done. OK, uh, right. Uh, very briefly, please, Angela and then Krista and then back uh, to Linda. One of the... We have the EIS working time agreement. All the teaching staff meet once a year um, and they agree how their 35-hour week will look, what that will look like. 
um, what a good one looks like. We often talk to the children when it's the same idea. However, the staff now come to that meeting and it's very much a paper exercise. Um, and often the head teacher will already have pencil drafted in you know, hours that he would suggest we, we do spend on forward planning or on assessment or family engagement. Um, but they're, they're, they're not doable. Um, the social aspect that Isabel brought up again, you know, bagpacking at weekends um, to raise money for school funds, etc. That's kind of become the norm, the, the normal expectation. Um, and oh, sorry, Angela. Sorry. I sorry, it was just the final yeah. point on the money and on, uh, you know, teachers very much. The, the good teachers don't tend to do it for money. Um, however, again. Going back 10 years, if you took responsibility for a curricular area, there was a small increment. Um, if you took children away for the week's excursion with the primary seven week away, um, you, there was a small increment in salary that you could apply for to your local council. Uh, that is no longer the case in my local <coughs> authority. I'm not sure about yourselves. Um, but there is no monetary incentive there for people to run extracurricular clubs. Um, lunchtime clubs, or take uh, be the coordinator of curricular area. Right. Okay. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, I agree with what Angela said about the working time agreement. We've just had our meeting, and it's very much a paper exercise as well. And I think that's part of the problem. Um, it feels like you're shuffling deck chairs. And when you asked the question, my first reaction was, I actually don't know. Um, sure, I think that's part of the problem. Sometimes I don't think teachers have got an outlet. Does it have to escalate to the point where we're talking to trade unions? And I think sometimes. You've really only the only option you've got is to run the risk of just sending a ranty email, and you don't actually have that opportunity to kind of voice concerns at a lower level where they could maybe be sorted. I think that's probably the the, the, the point I was making. I mean, the, is there some mechanism where you, you, uh, teachers within a local area can talk to their <laughs> education authority and and get? Because at the end of the day, you may well say some of this is is, is government changes that's causing the pressure and stuff like that. But you, your your immediate body as your education authority, do you not have any method of, of communicating with them, telling them what your problems are and try to get some resolve for them? No, if we do, and I wouldn't know what changes would happen if we've already taken right. part in that okay. process. Okay. Linda, you wanted yeah. to come well, I did attend a web seminar with the SQA on the new National 5 uh, changes for computing science. And I think well, there must have been, I don't know, about 100 computer science teachers throughout the country attended online. And basically, you're just told those are the changes. There's no way of feeding back. They're not interested in a dialogue. Right. OK. So I, I'm going to move on now. Uh, Tavish? Yeah. And can I, sorry, before Tavish starts, can I just ask everybody to keep things as tight as we possibly can and not necessarily feel that you have to respond? He always says that before I ask a question because he knows <laughs> I waffle on, uh, and, and, and he's quite right too. You know, I remember. Um, I wonder if I could ask one specific question of Isabel Marshall as a retiring head, and then a general question about teacher training and the evidence we were taking earlier on. Um, as a retiring head, you can be wonderfully objective about this now. There are proposals to give schools more, head teachers more autonomy. Will they help or hinder all the issues that you've been raising this morning? I'm a resigning head rather than a retiring head. I apologise. Yeah. 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 Um, Very important I'm, I'm, distinction. Yeah. It is, because I'm going off to find a different career. Yes. Um, and I'm in a fortunate position in the stage of my career where I can do that. Um, what, would you, uh, what could we do? Um, I mean, if you had more powers yeah, than um, as a head right now, would you be able to address, for example, the point about National Five, some of the changes there? Your your principal teacher comes in and says, "We can't even get the SQA to listen." If you were, if in this theoretical world, if you as a head could lift the phone to the head of the SQA and say, "This is not acceptable. My school's not going to be able to do this unless you do X, Y, and Z," would that be the kind of change that might help a head and therefore a school? I'm at a primary level, so I don't directly affect the, Sorry, uh, interact with the yeah. SQA. But um, in terms of speaking to the local authority, yes, I speak to the local authority. Yeah. Um, the biggest issue that I've spoken to the local authority about in the, the last year, and with staff as well, is about recruitment, um, not having enough people to do the job, mm. which then pulls people away from the jobs they should be doing to cover. Um, the other dif difficulty we've got is if something is coming directly to the schools, at the moment I don't have enough sp head space to deal with that. So if something's devolved directly to the school, pupil equity funding, for example, at the moment, you know, we're having the f trying to find the time to deal with that without it being over-bureaucratised. Um, so 
the, the spirit of that, where you know extra money is being devolved to the school, is I think the way ahead. As a group of teachers, teachers need to get better at saying we're going to do this instead of, because mm -hmm. teachers are fixers. When you're asked yeah. a teacher to do something, they'll do that on top of what they're already right. doing. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to empower our teachers. And I, I say that frequently at staff meetings, what are we doing this instead of? But then we need a culture at a wider level and school level to say this far and no further, or this is replacing this rather mm -hmm. than this is as well as. Mm -hmm. So it can be, it could be something that would be beneficial, but only if it's instead of rather than more. Yes. On top of. Uh -huh. Okay, very important principle. The, the, thank you. The wider question I wanted to ask was about the evidence we took on teacher training and particularly about placements, because our earlier brilliant panel all reflected the importance of teacher training and the placement part of it. And they cited numerous problems of how that works in practice. What's your professional take on that? And what, what are the things we could do to make that a lot better? Um, so, um, as being a newly qualified teacher, I could I had all the same problems that they they had. Um, I was quite lucky in that um, I had um, a, ch is it a chartered teacher status teacher um, as my probationary year, um, who who was amazing to be mentored by. But even then, they still don't have time really to to mentor you properly. Um, but um, yeah, the GTCS running, um, having people go commuting two hours one way and an hour the other way and three hours one way, it's just, it, it just adds to the stress and not having any money to, to, um, to cope with that. So I, can, I can go with uh, what was said. And some schools are expecting you and some aren't. <coughs> if, I, if I could go a little bit wider, I listened very, in it was very interesting what they said. And, um, and some of the problems they talked about, classroom management, we want to be in the classrooms, and they were wanting to develop the art of the classroom teacher. And that's what I heard them saying this morning. Now, for me, there's a problem in the way that we're actually pulling together our teachers. <clears throat> it was mentioned fast track, and that made me shudder a little bit. Because what we find is we get people that go do a three or four year degree in a subject area and then they do the one year of teaching. And to me, that's where the challenge is. So we've, you're, you're learning your French, you're learning your English, you're learning your history at university level, but, the, but the, the scientific art of the teaching is trying to be encapsulated in that one year's training. And they neither get a good job of the science of the training, the professional body of knowledge that informs their practice, or the art of practicing. And I feel there's something disproportionate about that. Now, one person this morning mentioned the idea of um, two years. Um, I know there's implications financial, but if you could put that aside for the moment, just what kind of teachers do you get at the end of it? And there's another thing I would, I would suggest to you. Yes, would you I would favor, example? actually, yeah. I would favor a B.Ed. Yes. I would, I would favor a four-year professional degree to make you into a teacher because you have to mature into it. So when you come out the door at the other end, you're ready. And all those little problems about uh, classroom management and all those other things, you know, you, they're not, they're not coming as surprises. How to do a register? How to, you know supervise corridors, how to deal with some of the, you know, the, the, you know, the additional support needs and, and how to deal with change and, and to understand the theory of how learners learn mm. and the theory how teachers teach, to apply it, to find your level and the art of saying, with that pupil and that group, this is the way to go. And I can, I can take from my toolkit, but they don't get enough time to build up their toolkit in one year. Um, so, you know, I think there's, a, there's an issue there with, about, the, about what they're doing. And I've got one little concern that sometimes, I, I, have, I as, a, as a faculty principal, I have taught some absolutely, despite what I've just said, outstanding people that have come in and done a fabulous job, right? But one of my problems is, given they're trying hard to recruit, and I've noticed from the statistics of the documentation we were given, you know, that there's under-recruitment in many areas, I don't feel that from some of the people I've seen come in and out of schools, they are selective enough. They are taking people into teaching that, that perhaps a, a more stringent uh, filtering system would say, 
you don't have what it takes to be a teacher to stand up in front of these groups and be tuned into the individual needs of a, of a collective classroom. And I know that's a, that's a hard one to filter through, but you know there, there are fundamental problems with that. Your assessment of whether that person will not make a teacher is at the end of that course or at the beginning. Well, is it a well, well, first of all, the way it is just now with with the one year course at the end, yeah. you know, they're filling, they're getting bums on seats, sure, sure. and perhaps that's that's a bit, a bit unfair. But I have seen one or two come through for whom I would have said, I don't think that's somebody that sh is suitable for teaching from the word go, that's right. and that's not even within my own faculty. Mm. But you say that I doubt very much that's only teachers that you get one or two that's people that come through that aren't that may be true that aren't fit for the job. Christopher, would you like? To coming at this from a slightly different angle, obviously being in Gaelic medium education. But um, I don't know if you're probably be aware that there's a Gaelic Immersion for Teachers course that's been going on. Um, I've had some recent experience with that and I've spoken to quite a lot of students that are on it. And the feedback I've heard and the results I've seen have been quite mixed. Um, I've had a few success stories, but I recently had um, a student that was on placement for it and there was barely a word of Gaelic spoken. Um, and the feedback I'd got from students was that there was nowhere near enough actual focus on the language. It seems to be a lot more focus on the achievement of a master's level qualification, pedagogy and things like that. It doesn't really seem to be fit for purpose. I'd spoken to a, a friend of mine who had learned Basque and worked in the Basque country where this model was adopted from. And he told me that the, the course that this was based on in Basque would be 12 months long uh, with 12 units. Um, and after each 12 unit, you would have to set a test to prove that you met that certain criteria. And only after you passed all 12 units would you be deemed fit enough to work in vast medium education. And I just don't see the same level of standards being applied in Gaelic. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Tavish. Uh, Ross? Just uh, very quickly before I come on to ASN, just picking up on what you'd said previously, Sean, I'm wondering specifically, you were talking about the sheer amount that you have to manage. What is then the balance for you between teaching time and the amount of time you spend simply managing your departments? Um, I'm lucky because, you know, I've got a lot of mileage on my, on my clock. So <laughs> I can walk into a class and I think I have got the art of the teaching and I understand my subject area. So I feel my standing in front of the classroom time isn't as demanding as perhaps a, you know, a, a teacher in the beginning of their career. Um, but w I am also lucky because I have fantastic teachers who work with as part of my faculty and I delegate and they willingly take, them, take on these responsibilities and that's one of the ways that I manage because they're highly motivated, they're very professional and as we've said, they take on extra responsibilities. Um, perhaps because, you know, just innate, uh, you know, the joy of the subject area, they can see where it's going to go. Perhaps it will enhance their promotional chances because they're building up their, their you know, experience portfolio and things like that. So that's how I manage. But, but I do, there are times something good gets a bit slack at times and sometimes I do get caught in the hop. But I'm lucky because of what I've just said. Um, but but I have people that work with me and I go and get advice and so on and so forth and prioritise. Thanks very much. Um, it slightly falls on from that, but specific question, I'd be interested in Andrew's thoughts on this, but anyone else. We've had feedback in the past from teachers, particularly newly qualified teachers, about career progression and how career progression very quickly, it gets to a point where you have to go into management or you cannot progress any, any further. Um, and in relation to additional support needs, I was wondering what your thoughts were on ASN teaching being a promoted post in itself. I actually think that would be fantastic. I think it's, it's long overdue. Um, I think the, the B.Ed. could easily be, you know, you do, you do your four year degree with a particular emphasis on additional support needs throughout. Um, what, what Sean was saying earlier, um, the teachers actually were, were coming out, the, the trainees had mentioned earlier as well, you're coming out with skills that you've, you've honed yourself from, from through your own educational experiences. Um, and you may not be the most numerate, but you're, you're then going out to teach numeracy, for, an, for example. Um, the, the, the universities definitely need to do more with that. Um, but additional support needs 
over and above everything else. I think it has to be taught more concisely and, and definitely um, within the colleges. And we're seeing NQTs coming out who really are quite frightened by some of the behaviours um, that they're seeing in the classrooms and very unclear on how to begin approaching that, never mind planning a personal learning programme. Important distinction um, here. Uh, I mean, back in the in the traditional days, it was you got an extra increment on the salary if you were like having responsibility for uh, additional support needs. Um, that was attractive at the time. And if you're going for a, a solely more of a, a focused pupil support job, then yes, that makes sense. However, when you look at the classroom nowadays, pretty much every single teacher in the school is a additional support needs teacher. Because whereas before maybe you had maybe one or two in the classroom um, with um, statemented needs or whatever, or very specific needs, you've now got in a classroom of 28, you've got about 15 of them, all with individual programmes, statements, records of needs, things that you need to be aware of. Um, so every single teacher, in theory, then should be a promoted post because you know if that's the line you're going to go down, just because of the sheer volume and the, the mechanics of doing it all. Um, and to try and keep on top of all that, um, even although you've maybe not got responsibility for doing the IEPs yourself, um, but you're asked to sort of feed into it from the support department and things. Um, the Sorry, I've lost track of what I want to say. Um, being a, a support teacher is different to um, having a mainstream teacher who's got maybe 15 kids in your class and you haven't got the first clue how to cope with them. And I think that's where a lot of people are struggling. And then that's where we have to go to our support colleagues and we're kind of saying, I don't know how to do with these 15 clope in the class because he says B and he says A and they can't be in the same room at the same time, but they are, and what am I to do with it? Um, and then they're the ones that are going, well, I've not really got time to talk you through how to try and do this. And you know what I mean? So it's kind of a vicious circle that all goes round, really. Going back to the, the evidence we had in the previous session, um, my impression of that very much was that NQTs are coming out with a wildly inconsistent level of knowledge in additional support needs, depending on simply where they went to university. Is that your experience as a newly qualified teacher or as folk who, who work with NQTs all the time? We need to be careful about is the aggregation of children with additional support needs. Uh, we've got social needs, we've got educational needs, we've got behavioural needs. So somebody might come out very well trained in dyslexia or autism, but then be thrown by a child who has behavioural needs or emotional needs. You know, we've got and we've got nurture bases in our school to deal with emotional needs. Children are highly skilled and teachers are highly skilled in that and taking it forwards. That's different from dealing with a child in your class who has a sight problem. So I think when we're talking about people training with uh, meeting ESN needs for pupils. We need to be well aware of that breadth of, ex of experience that's required. Yeah, I think that's very much where you're trying to find the balance between giving <clears throat> all newly qualified teachers that broad level of knowledge and points that have been brought up in this session and the previous one about the need for specialist staff, because even a, a specialist additional support needs teacher, as we've just discussed, the breadth of support needs there. Someone, we've had you know, evidence before of a young person who was uh, deaf, finding that the support staff they got knew everything there was to know about autism, but they weren't autistic, they simply couldn't hear wildly different needs, it's about finding that balance. What Sean said, you know, over a, a PG course, it's very difficult to give teachers experience of all of that. Over a four year B Ed, you've got a greater experience, uh, a greater chance of getting children, in, uh, children, the breadth of children's experience to the teachers. Okay. Inclusion. Um, if that was possible, the transition from inclusion from primary schools to secondary schools is extremely difficult and I don't think enough money or time has been spent on dealing with the mental health issues that children with additional support needs go through, moving from a primary um, class in school into a secondary class in school. Um, I know that one of my pupils is now entering through a canteen entrance to his high school every day. 
can't come in with the rest of the pupils because of his electric wheelchair and the, the ramp that he's needed uh, to get in and out. Um, I do think that inclusion needs to be more doing and less talking about. You know, we've decided that inclusion is for all and we're going to have fully included schools, mainstream schools with children being included, but the money needs to be put in to support those pupils, whether as individuals as in, or as in small groups. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll move on. There. Sorry, right, Liz. Thank you, um, Mrs. Marshall. Can I draw you back to a comment you made about recruitment? Because obviously, as a head teacher, that's something that's uh, extremely important. And you implied that there are some issues when you're recruiting staff. Could you uh, tell us why you think that we have some issues about recruiting sufficient staff? I think there is a perception that it's a, a very rewarding job, but there's also a perception it's a very difficult job, and it is a difficult job. I'm concerned that the media portrayal of education is often the extreme. You know, we see the, the television programmes where children are very badly behaved, and that the focus is on the very badly behaved children. I think it's important we get the PR out there that the majority of children aren't what, what we see as these kind of extreme children. Um, I think salaries, what was mentioned earlier, you know, at the, at the state, early stages, somebody's career is important. Um, I don't think there's a differential there between somebody moving into a promoted post. Um, I would also like the return of the chartered teacher, where teachers were rewarded for staying in their classrooms and being good models. I think that was a very good um, area of promote, where, where teachers could come into teaching and stay in teaching without going into promoted posts as management posts. In terms of getting people in as well, my two children, have, my two sons are at university just now. Having just left secondary, neither of them want to go back into school as teachers because they see teachers working very hard, being badly treated by members of uh, the classes. Um, so I think asking 18, 19 year olds to choose to become teachers is very difficult if they've not had a good experience of school themselves. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, it's very helpful. Um, obviously within some of the evidence that we've had presented to the committee, there are some concerns that at times, uh, particularly when it comes to dealing with the shortage of teachers in specific areas, that we're not very good about allowing teachers who might be extremely well qualified and very successful teachers from other jurisdictions uh, to be able to come and teach in Scotland. And we had what I thought was very interesting evidence uh, this morning from Mark Melrose when he uh, told us about the uh, skills which he had had, but because one unit wasn't properly recognised, there was a major issue for him. Now, I find that extraordinary that somebody can be debarred um, simply because they've got actually very good skills. Have you, have you or any of your colleagues as heads had this issue come up when you're trying to recruit people that there might be offers from elsewhere, but we've got uh, constraints on GTCS registration. I've had positive experiences where people have done the conversion course or the returner to teacher course as well, where they've come in, uh, they've perhaps trained as teachers, I've got a teacher working with me just now, who trains the teacher has taken a career break before she'd qualified and then came back in. Um, she's brought back in extra experience, extra life experience and that's been very positive. Um, I'd like to see that extended, yes, I think that's very positive. Um, and I think Mark's experience of you know, recruiting people with skills from outside school um, are very important. My own career has been from school to college to school. Yep. Um, and I work with people who've come in later in their career and I think they've brought huge benefits to the school bringing in that working from outside education. Um, perspectives into classroom and into management roles as well. Uh, and could I just finish on the point, do you have any specific recommendation uh, to make as to how we would uh, extend that and open it up a little bit? I think offering people the opportunity to go into schools on some sort of secondment to see if it was for them would be a good idea. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dan? The question actually follows on from some of the comments from, from Sean Harley and, 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 and Linda Robertson, I think. Um, you mentioned kind of the structure of the course. Um, I, I've, uh, I also have questions about uh, curriculum for excellence and, and, and its implications on teacher training. I think curriculum for excellence is very ambitious, but I think that also places challenges on teachers because it is open, it's not prescriptive. Do you think that teacher training currently prepares teachers adequately to teach to curriculum for excellence? And, and, and if there are gaps, what, what are they and how would they be addressed? 
If you ask 100 teachers what is curriculum for excellence, I suspect you've got 100 different answers. To me, what curriculum for excellence is about is about this idea of undoing the box of the classroom that was driven to the SQA exams in the hope that when you get out of school, you would see the connection between what you learned in school and what you're trying to do out, out with that. Curriculum for excellence is saying, open up the school, open up the classroom, open up the pupils, and see that this is a whole gestalt of experience that the pupils are moving forward with, and that we are being, we are contributors to that, as well as the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides and you know, the skiing holiday and everything else that pupils do. Um, could you tune me back into the specifics of your question again? Adequately prepares teachers for that context and expectation that you just described? I don't think it does, but I don't think it could, to be honest with you, because I feel that this is part of the maturing into the profession um, process, and I think that will take time, because I think the profession themselves are working to mature into it. Okay. So, you know, in, until the, you know, the, the, body, the professional body they're moving into has got a strong sense of what their identity is with regards to curriculum for excellence, it's very hard to then to sort of convey that to, to trainee teachers and so on. So the answer is no, but I don't see that as a fault, particularly of okay. the training programmes. That makes sense. I don't think I could have done it at 22. I think I'm co coped um, because I have got a knowledge of industry and, and an understanding of my subject area so that I can cover all the areas that the Curriculum for Excellence is f for in computing science covers. Um, Linda, you also made a very interesting comment that from your industry background, you felt that Curriculum for Excellence needed a project manager. Um, and, and indeed, Sean, you said you weren't quite sure who was in charge. Do either of you have a good feeling of who is in charge of curriculum for excellence and who is controlling the, the, its implementation? Um, no, no, I don't. Um, the internet, who's in charge of the internet? It's one of those things, it's a hybrid of different perspectives and ideas and um, innovations and so on and so forth. I mean, fr from your perspectives, do you feel it's under control? No. Is it under control? The, the changes to the curriculum for excellence. I think schools are doing the absolute, absolute I agree best with you. to make it, to try and recognise what it's trying to do and to build the pupils' experience around those ideals of the curriculum for excellence. So, in, that, in as much as it's not, they're not freewheeling. No. You know, they're looking to the reference points of the documentation and the guidance and the best practice to try and pull together a programme that's going to move forward with the, with the ideas and aspirations of curriculum for excellence. So it is under control that way, but I'm not sure we're all necessarily interpreting the same way. But, but just for the record, when I, when I said that, I, and I take your point, I think schools are doing a phenomenal job about managing that, but the process externally doesn't feel under control. Is that how people feel? Yeah. I wonder if there's a case for a non-political body being in charge of education. Because every time we get a new education, Minister for Education, they want to make their, their role, they want to you know, make themselves feel, feel as though they've had an effect. So they change things. And th do they necessarily change things for the benefit of the pupils? Well, the latest PISA results would suggest not. So is there a case for having a non-political body in charge that doesn't change every time a minister changes. Question. So I've got one final question. Um, just in the previous evidence session, a very specific point around the sort of the, the deliverability of NAT4 and NAT5 in a single year and whether or not you could actually teach what you needed to teach within that year was raised. I was just wondering what the reflections are of, of this panel on, on that specific point. Um, I think most of you were in the room when it was raised. There's been changes in computing science because there was too much in National 5 computing science. So the changes are good, but they've not been planned. They've just been given to us to implement. So right. coming from a project manager of, an I, of big IT projects, um, I would be going back to my project manager and telling them that I can't actually implement them in three weeks, but they are good changes. But so the, the new National 5 for computing science should be able to be done in a year.
But to the specific point about some kids being disadvantaged by just what needs to be taught in a year, is that something that people on this panel would concur with or not? Because I yes. think that's quite an important point. Well, I think most schools do start their, their, um, their National 5 course. Well, they start it now. I'm going to move on to Gillian now. Yeah, um, you're not the first uh, group of teachers that we've spoken to. We've done quite a lot of sessions, so ad hoc, so after the hours, we've had teachers in the Parliament. Uh, Colin Beattie and myself had a panel of teachers a couple of months ago. And um, one of the things that came out from what they said was around the importance of early years education and having children been exposed to education before they come into primary school. A lot of those teachers came from schools in quite deprived areas where there was high instances of poverty. And I wonder if, I'd like to know your, I, I, we don't know which schools you're from, so I don't know where, where you're actually teaching, but do you agree with, with those teachers that, that by getting children involved in education earlier, that that might make an impact on a lot of the kind of classroom management issues that you as primary teachers have to face. And a lot of the things, for example, that Angela's mentioned about all the pastoral issues on top of it. And I'd like to know your thoughts on that. The better, but I think there is the case that we need to go earlier than um, anti-preschool years. Um, and that I think a lot of the checks, um, I, I don't know for sure, but a lot of the checks by health visitors that used to happen, your yearly checks, before you start school aren't happening anymore, and so they're not able to flag up children. So that by the time a child comes into preschool at three, there's already three years that where action could have been taken. They could have been referred to a vulnerable twos group, for example. So I think, yes, in order to close the attainment gap, that needs to start earlier than school. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear from other people uh, your, your issues on that, because it was something that came across very strongly from those teachers, that by the, time, by the time children go into nursery education, that really a lot of the learning could have happened before that, especially in the areas where there's extreme poverty. Um, yeah, I, just want, I agree. I think there is a lot that could happen before they get to, to nursery. However, at the moment, the shift is to take teachers out of nursery, and so that's a huge issue. If we're saying that we need, we need to have teachers in nurseries for, for these children from three, how does that work if we're taking them out of nursery because um, the funding's not there or we just don't have enough teachers or there's no longer a requirement for a teacher to have contact with a nursery child every single day of the week? How does that... And I think we're talking about two different things here. But what you're talking about, Judith, is the, the, the sort of like the, the conditions of the home and, and, and the early rearing of the child before we get to the, the nursery stage. Yeah. My next point. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 but what I'm saying is they're two different things. I think it's part of the same question, because the question was early teachers within the early years environment, how does that impact? And can we do it earlier? Yes, we can do it earlier. We could have, you could have teachers working in um, fully qualified teachers in nursery settings from age six months, if you wanted, but are maybe attached. Some schools do have these nurseries. The focus of the current government is to put more into early years education to maybe address I, I, some of the things that you've been talking about I, today. Yeah, we are aware of that, but, you're, yeah. but in, my, in my council area, after the summer holidays, there will, each, nursery, each nursery will only have a 0.5 teacher. So that teacher will only have contact with children Half of the time. The teacher, the teacher was very good as well in linking to having a teacher in nursery was very good to link to health visitors and speech therapists, um, and there was backwards and forwards training, uh, so that the speech therapist could train the teachers and the learning assistants in how to help from their skills, and, and, and similarly we could link that whole process into education. So that multi-agency working is vital, and I think we've moved away from that, unfortunately. To the deficit of the children. I wanted to come in. So it's crucial to get parents involved in the early education as soon as possible so that that then continues throughout um, the years. And in our school, in particular, we've been trying very hard with parental engagement, um, uh, having play days where the parents are in actually shadowing what the nursery staff are doing, watching how to read a story with expression, using props, using puppets. And we've now led it into the primary. So the group that we started at three, now in primary one, and 
the parents that are actually working have sent a gran or an auntie along 20 minutes a week and they're involved in storytelling with the children using magnetic letters, boards, etc. So that parents are learning how to do literacy at home and that it's not... Right, from the local authority, is that a decision that's made at the local authority or is that at school level? Where you... it, it was actually in our improvement plan three years ago and it's how we've managed to sustain it and then take it forward and have more of an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping to use obviously some of the PEF funding to continue to make that right. more sustainable. Right. Um, you, John. Right, thanks very much, John. Yeah, thanks very much. <clears throat> and I think I'm very struck by, you know, when I think when I started teaching, it was the norm at intervals and lunch times you went down and you talked to your colleagues. By the time I left, that was already changing, but my sense is that the pressures on teachers now are even more massive than when I left. And I'm trying to get, and there is a lot said to us about there's not enough support staff or classroom assistants are reducing, there's less learning support, um, all of which brings pressures on the teacher. But I wondered, and there's, it, what bits are there, is it also the case that some of the pressures are on you, are there other bits of support that would make a difference? I mean, is, has admin support changed? I mean, anecdotally, we've heard that you know, teachers are more likely to have to do their own photocopying than, than my generation would, well, it wouldn't even be photocopying my generation, but you know, that somebody else did that, those practical things that allowed you to focus on teaching. Is that the case, or are, are the greater pressures almost all about teaching and the curriculum and the lack of support in terms of learning as opposed to the managing of the process around learning? I, I'm lucky I have a full-time pupil support worker because I have a child who needs a full-time pupil support worker. But if I need photocopying done or resources made up or um, forms completed for going on school trips, I have to do those. And they have to be done within the context of everything else that we have to do as a teacher. Um, when I first started, pupil support workers would cover boards, they would do wall displays, they would do the photocopying. That doesn't happen anymore. Certainly not in my school. And is that because they are stretched? They are doing more it's, than... There aren't enough of them. Yeah. They're just, they're, there aren't enough pupil support workers. And the ones we do have are allocated to children who have specific needs, which okay. is what they should be used for. I suppose the other thing I was struck by around reading the evidence, both from yourselves and from others, was the gap between the theory of what was happening in the school and the reality. So I think you mentioned there's not much garlic getting spoken. There's issues around supply che teachers. So therefore, the subject specialists are teaching the top end of the school and the supply teachers are doing for S1 to S3, which would presumably has consequence for subject choices. To what extent do you think that that's true? That, you know, theoretically, you've got a learning support person, but they're used for cover in primary school or whatever. And I wonder if you've got... Can you give us a sense of that, where that actually is in terms of how it's impacting on the ability of the school to deliver what it's supposed to be doing? Today, the support for learning teachers covering my class, okay. which means the children that she should be working with today won't get support from her, okay. because there are no supply teachers. Should have one, one. Yes, we've we had the same issue with, with supply teaching staff and our le learning support teacher will be asked to go and cover classes around the learn um, when there's no other cover that can be found. But also the lack of supply, we find hits us, especially with visiting specialists. Our visiting specialists um, provide our macrone time and so regularly you're teaching more than your classroom hours because the visiting support teachers are filled and you can't get supply teacher. And quite often staff will come to work over and over again when they're not well and they get more and more unwell until they're off for a week, whereas maybe if they've gone off for a couple of days, but they don't want to go off because they know that'll leave the school short of a teacher. Can I ask if that's logged anywhere? Because, you know, this thing about further down in secondary school, people not being taught by subject specialists or you know, the, the theoretical learning support always being covered. Is that locked anywhere so that a local authority would know the gap between what is actually the, the, what should be the provision and what is actually the provision within a school? Appendix one at the end of every week, um, outlining how much cover I've provided and how much cover the head teachers provided. I'm in class, I'm class committed two days a week, and management three days a week, but often a day, a day and a half a week is done on class cover. 
and the management work are then doing more time at home. I would also say that we've got, we've got staff awaiting 17 and a half hours cover back for not having had Macron. I've got two members of staff that are owed 17 and a half hours. Um, authority as well they gather statistics we're asked to phone in if we're short and let them know why, who we're short and who will be covering where, where we have can cover internally who would cover internally so they're logging that centrally this is a consequence i mean is there a kind of a trigger point where you know, the, the consequence is that this first year class never gets a physics specialist or science specialist because somebody's in long-term sick, does it trigger anything anywhere? At primary you? level, it means heads and deputies are supplying okay. class contact or daily cover for classes. So you've increased management responsibilities, but you have to do them out with school effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know from my own school that they can't get the cover. I mean, they really go out and they actually send emails, do you know anyone who has retired who would be willing to come in First of all, as a French teacher to teach French, but an any teacher to teach that to cover that class. So it's not that the schools aren't trying desperately to give the pupils the experience that they should be getting, even though a teacher's off or as close to as they can get. Um, that's, that's a quality experience. They just can't get the cover because it's just not there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Linda, very briefly well, then. Um, the, uh, computer and science can't get teachers, basically. So um, in my school, there would be a supply teacher who's not a computer and science teacher covering first and, and second, year second year classes. Um, and, and I would be putting resource in for that. So I'm just a newly qualified teacher doing resourcing uh, a supply teacher's class and my own at the same time. And again, coming back to admin, and, and I haven't figured out how you buy stuff in schools yet. If anybody would like to tell me how to do that, could they let me know? <laughs> it's should, different should in every you. school. Yeah, it can, and then Christoph. So, um, just, I'm dual qualified in maths and computing. Um, and obviously supply is my main kind of thing. Um, the number of times that I have been desperate for supply work and I've not been phoned, and it's to the best of my knowledge, it's not because I'm a rubbish teacher or anything like that. Um, in our local authority, for example, we've had some um, computing teachers who are a dying breed, it does have to be said, um, that have been on long-term sick. But um, I'm known throughout every school in my authority. And exactly as you're saying, you use the, the sort of grapevine. You're saying, right, Karen's sitting at home doing nothing. I texted her last night. She can come in and do like fill in this double higher computing period and the kids aren't going to miss out. And the general response is, we've got to wait until they're off three weeks before we can buy in cover. Okay, there's there's political things in the middle level that maybe schools have no idea about. So would this, sorry, can, can I just clarify this bit then? Uh, if, is that a decision that the school would make, the local authority would make, the government would make? I mean, where would a decision such as that come from? To be fair, we're very unclear. It seems to come from the local authority and from what I can piece together from what people are telling me in my local authority. Um, well, I actually interact with three local authorities because I'm kind of bang smack yeah. in the middle of three of them. But in all three, they have a similar thing um, that they won't buy the cover in until it's been a certain amount of time or they're like, well, we've got a surplus in this and they're over, so we've just got to use them. We're not allowed to get you in. Um, and the, when the supply rules changed um, to have, like I'm at the top of my pay scale now, but most of the time I am juggled so that I'm always paid at my first entry point of my pay scale, um, even though they need my experience and my expertise of presenting students okay. for exams in both maths and computing regularly to kind of fill in the gaps. So. There are a lot of supply teachers out there who are willing to go and do more and would come back to teaching. But it's, it's the politics and the support, the support a school gives you as a supply teacher varies horrendously. Um, and you are seen as lowest of the low. You are seen as not a real teacher. And yet we are the ones that everyone's calling for to help them just get through a school day. Mm -hmm. um, okay. okay, thank you for that, Krista. 
just coming at this again from the perspective of Gaelic medium education and very specifically secondary. Um, as you were saying, it's quite difficult to recruit uh, Gaelic teachers. You're obviously drawn from a smaller pool. Um, it's harder to find teachers um, and sometimes that means hiring good teachers that don't speak a lot of Gaelic or don't speak any Gaelic with the aspiration that they'll learn that but what the issue is is it's try how do they find the time and how is that facilitated and imagine all the, the kind of challenges that we've heard today and then imagine on top of that you could have kids or other things going on in your personal life trying to learn the language on the fly as well it's really really difficult um, and I think maybe we would have to look at something like relief cover or something like that to facilitate something happening, or maybe even look at some sort of joined up approach that could work across authorities or nationally about how we could actually support teachers to do that. Because I know a lot of my colleagues, they're going to night classes and things like that, and they are striving to do stuff, but it's such a challenge. I don't necessarily think there's such an overarching kind of strategy that we can all draw upon, and certainly not a consistent one across different schools. That's a fair point. Okay, the, the last question is from Claire Hawkey. Thank you, Dana. Um, I, I, I just want to go back a little bit, if I can, but just a, a, a very a brief, specific question. You have all, in various ways, raised concerns about stress, additional workload, pressures on you, additional hours. You're all local authority employees, am I right? Yeah. So what supports are your local authorities putting in? They have a duty of care as your employer. So what supports do they put in for you? We have a helpline that you can ring, and um, <laughs> it'll offer you um, six counselling sessions. Okay. I have a, a schools group manager who I meet with regularly, and I've discussed issues with her, and I find that you know very useful. Um, and that's an individual at local authority level that's available to us to talk about ways forward. But again, there are very limited things that are available to us. We are recommended to use the counselling hotline. I don't know about the authority particularly, but I know there's lots of helplines and they're, I mean, they're out there. But I think the, the first port of call is who the head teacher of the school and the senior management in terms of that support. That's the absolute first port of call. If it's getting to the point where you have to go to the external agencies, then something's been lost between you being in the classroom and being able to manage your, your role. And I, I've found, you know, various experiences, but uh, generally speaking, I find my experience have been supportive within the school. So I've never had to call on the external agencies within the authority. Dear Isabel Marshall. The, the first port of call is always your, your, career, your, your colleagues. And I mean, colleagues are very, very supportive of each other. And we, we have a, a really good social group within the school who support each other. Um, then you've got your management team and your head teacher. There comes a kind of squeeze in the whole process. You're the jam and the sandwich. So is, is there a way, I'm quite taken aback by you immediately you say outside, you know, phone lines, help lines. Is there a way for you as teachers, as head teachers, to feed up the management chain and local authorities that this is a concern, you need to do something, you need to take action? If, with, with a group of head teachers and, and union representatives, we've met with the head with the head of schools, and we've discussed that. Um, we were, you know, we met as a meeting to to problem solve. Um, it was very difficult to find solutions that were easily accessible. Sorry. Sorry. Our local authority has a uh, quality improvement officers now, who, when when they manage to get a time in their timetable, they will come out and see you, but it could be several weeks after you've maybe brought up a concern, um, and then you express your concern. That's it. The question about feedback to the student teachers, um, I, I, I'm not getting a sense here that, that, the, that your concerns are being listened to or addressed. I feel the concerns are listened to. I, I, um, in terms of address, no, I don't know really what resources there are beyond that. But certainly, you know, we have raised them. They've been listened to. Mm -hmm. yeah, so would you say that to the critical issues, that the resources available to local authorities to actually deal with the issues that have been raised? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. There's a critical issue about what resources are available to local authorities. Yeah. There's, um, yeah. As a, 
as a profession as well, we need to collectively agree on how we can go forward and what we need, what our needs are. Yes. yes. Just because the, the point that I raised initially was your local authorities as your employer have a duty of care to you. Do you feel they're carrying out that duty of care to you as teachers? Um, I, I'm, I mean, there are, there are processes we can do. We, we rely on our colleagues, we teach to head teachers, but I think the fundamental problem is the workload is so great that, that it wouldn't matter if the local authority do listen to us. There isn't a lot that they can do. There's not enough of us as a profession. There aren't enough teachers, there are not enough resources, there's not enough time. So they may listen to us, but it comes down, it does, as you say, it comes down to there aren't the resources. But they have a duty of care to They do have a that. duty of care, absolutely, but... but you have to sort of be level advocates. How, what, what are they going to do if they don't have the funding to put in 10 more teachers or they don't have 10 more teachers to put into each school? It's kind of a vicious circle until the money and the, till the, money and the teachers and the funding are in place. Our workload is just going to continue to grow. In social work, they have a supervision system. And one thing I have suggested is that we should have some sort of supervision system for teachers where the, there's a regular counselling approach used. I would agree with you. I come from a nursing background, and I think yeah. super, clinical supervision is, is, is a, a very valuable tool in terms of a personal development and, and um, dealing with, with difficult issues with colleagues. But, but I think this is, a, this is a much bigger issue than just dealing with you. I think there's, there's an organisational feeling here. Sure. You're quite sh I mean, I'm, I'm nodding in agreement with everything that's been said, but I know in my authority they did two investigations into workload and they spoke to teachers and they had panels and everything else, two of them, and it didn't change the workload one bit. In fact, it just got worse and worse. So perhaps maybe they're, they're trying to exercise their duty of care by finding out what exactly is going on in the schools, but there's no specific action that's taking place and then there's no feedback about well where's the specific action that just kind of gets lost okay uh, well just before I, I thank you i think there's something that we we need to make clear here and i think that some of it gets, gets lost in that last wee thing there the duty of care as claire said but also the the local authorities are the people who make the decisions about the number of teachers, the number of classroom assistants, the number of supply teachers. Now, I accept that they work under a budget, but it seemed to be that they were almost being missed out here in terms of being held responsible for anything like this. And I think that responsibility has to lie. That's why I asked the question about, is this government, is this local authority, or is it within the school? Because, you know, there, there are different levels of responsibility that lie at different places. And I think we have to make sure that we, we hold to account those who are responsible for each different part of that. But uh, can I um, thank you very much for that? That was, that was really, really helpful, really helpful. It's given us a lot to to digest and uh, after the next few weeks when we've got the other panels in, I'm sure that a report will make for interesting reading. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you. And I close the public session. <laughs>